Yes, hello everyone. I'm a little late for this, but this is my opinion piece for the November 9th, 2020 Board of Supervisors meeting. There was a lot of work done at this meeting, but I'm going to focus primarily on the audit report, which the supervisors only gave six minutes time to discuss, mostly slapping each other's backs for a good job done, but they never discussed anything about the relevant information. The comment from Joe Staub that it was a clean audit. I've never heard that uh, term used in, in audits. I've done over 200 audits, closer to 250 audits. And uh, they did have a, uh, a, uh, an opinion, a good opinion about the financials, but those financials were presented by the management. What they don't talk about is the results of the numbers of what they did in 2019. But we will do that here. And uh, I need my reading glasses for some of this. But the audit report was, is 93 pages long. So it's a lot of information to digest. So I'm gonna focus on uh, some of the most important parts of this audit. And uh, that would be what's called MDNA management's discussion and analysis. It's pages six to 17, 12 pages long. And they failed to honestly discuss the results of this audit and the results of operations for 2019. But they've glossed over that for many years now, and you'll see why they've done that. But uh, uh, they did not talk about the results at all. Also, the auditors uh, make a point of discussing COVID-19 and how the COVID-19 situation, those issues could have a significant impact on the township's revenues and expenses in the future, which is something that completely goes over the head of our supervisors. They worked on a budget, which they recently approved which really should have been a bare bones budget, but they've thrown everything in there. They're gonna spend, spend, spend like they've done in the past. And like I said, at this meeting, there was absolutely no discussion about management's, uh, the MDNA, management discussions and analysis. Why would they? It's all bad. I mean, it's very bad. If I were to grade their results for 2019, I would give them an F minus. And a lot of this has to do with the guy who was the chairman of the board, John Casadas. He, he came into power in April when Lisa Vanderlane resigned abruptly without any good reasons. And he became like the little dictator. Uh, you will see if you look at the minutes or review the videos of the meetings, never any discussion on cutting costs ever but he threw a lot of people out of meetings. He cut people short when they were trying to speak. He was very rude to other citizens who came to the meetings. He was a disaster and he continues to be a disaster. And it's, it's a shame that we cannot get rid of him, but he's an embarrassment to this community. So bear that in mind as I go through this and we start talking about the, uh, five million dollars that we spent over our income and for the last two years it's over six million dollars that we spent over our revenue numbers no one no business no municipality can continue to do this sort of thing without falling into a deep hole and big troubles uh you know the problem here is that they want to act like a a public corporation, the way they pay the salaries to our employees, you know, many of them are close to $100,000 or over per year, but they do not have the work experience. They're, uh, they're just below what we should expect from them. So you're going to see two slides that follow my opinion piece here, which will explain how uh, they have hurt our community. I mean, really badly hurt our community. And this will be at a top level. But if you wanna see something a little more detail, you could go to page 22 on the audit report, 
uh, it's a better display of the overall results. And what it shows is that we spent $22 million more than what we brought in as revenue. We had $22 million deficit for 2019. Absolutely unacceptable. Now, they'll give you all kinds of excuses and reasons for this, but, you know, don't believe them. You know the old story, talking with a forked tongue? Well, these guys have two forked tongues. You know, the sale of the sewer facility had to be done, and you will see this in the numbers. This is the only way they could cover up their malfeasance, their mismanagement of our township finances which just doesn't, wasn't just done in 2019, but was done since Lisa Vanderlein became a board member and took over the Board of Supervisors uh, like four or five years ago. And then she brought in John Casadas and she brought in Vinnie B and Coney and, these, and Dave Spies. And these are the people that supported the activities that are leading to a, a situation that is gonna be desperate in a couple of years. So they had to sell it. They moved $79 million from the sale of the sewer plant into the government activity section to cover up the huge deficits that we were creating. And then they divvied up some of the money for various things, capital equipment, and uh, paid off the, of course they had to pay off the sewer debt, which is part of those expenses uh, but some of the things that caused their deficit, of course, other than paying off the bonds for the sewer plant, they bought the promenade for $2.6 million. Now, the only way they could do that was by raiding a CD, a $7.3 million CD from the sewer plant. That CD was set up years ago to pay the debt on the sewer plant and to also be used for maintenance if it was required. And of course, we all know they deferred the maintenance on this plant from the time that Vanderlane got on board and, and until we sold it and transferred millions of dollars to EEMA, uh, which was who is an associate of Granger. So remember, all these things are my opinion. And uh, so the promenade, $2.6 million. And they don't talk about the fact, see, they should be reviewing all this. We paid Viva. We had to settle with Viva almost $1.9 million. But it doesn't stop there. The, the legal fees associated with that lawsuit were over a million dollars. So there's almost $3 million or more that we spent on a lawsuit that wasn't necessary. We have the video proof where they admit it. We know who started this. You know, John Crusaders, who's still on the board, he seconded the motion to kick Viva out just because of this liquor license. And then we have a video where John Granger admits that all we had to do was we had we should have hired the bar staff and there wouldn't have been a contract dispute. But they created this scenario for a number of reasons, in my opinion, to pay exorbitant fees to uh, Fox Rothschild which was uh, connected with Lisa Vanderlane, and to eliminate everyone who worked for the township down at the sewer plant and replace them with EEMA, who had no idea how to run the plant. And we know this because we have a memo from EEMA management telling us that we don't have the experience to run this plant and you laid off everybody who did. This was simply a mechanism to transfer our tax dollars to John Granger's buddy, Ken Gillette, or Ed Gillette, I'm sorry. I know it, Ken Gillette, but this is Ed Gillette, Edward Gillette. So here we are facing, the, you can see some of these things coming out now, what they're doing. Uh, and there are more things that, that they did that they wasted their money on without looking at the budget we went way over budget, of course. And you can see that in the numbers that we're going to present. Uh, more on the slides. And then there are some other things that happened in this meeting that I'd 
like to talk about, but I do not have enough time, but I'll mention them and you can go look at them in the video. And that's the number one is the restructure of the debt. It's unnecessary. It's more wasted money. For what purpose? They want to they want to improve the cash flow now. And then we have to deal with it in the end again, like they're claiming we have to do now. So they want more money that they can throw away and waste and, in my opinion, steal. Then uh, the promenade, right? The, the, the destruction of it, they're going to do, demo the promenade. And this is terrible because that building could really be fixed up no matter how much they tell us that it's, it's gone. There's no report. It's never been condemned. They had people working in there up to the end. They had to kick out. So, you know, what's going on here? So this is another false narrative. And they present us with many, many false narratives, like selling the sewer plant. The only reason, as you will find out, that we sold that sewer plant was to cover up the mismanagement of our finances and the malfeasance caused by supervisors who got greedy and were developing and devising ways to separate the taxpayers' money from the, the township into pockets of their associates. See, they can't steal the money personally because the Ethics Act would, uh, you know, put them in jail. So what you have to do is you have to have a third party who's unelected, who like, like consultants and other people. You pay them a nice fee. And, you know, in my opinion, you got your hand behind your back and somebody puts a little envelope in there with a screen paper inside. That's how it works. You know, for example, another item on this meeting I won't talk about master plan that they gave to uh, Simone Collins. We're going to pay them $100,000. Now, 50 of it is a grant from the state, but we have to match it with another 50 grant. So someone else came in with a lower bid and, and Simone Collins said they would they would deduct $50 from their big bid. I mean, you know, it's like the supervisors are giving us the, the bird constantly, you know, and laughing at us. But Simone Collins is a a company associated with John Granger. He and Lisa Vanderlein brought them here and they're milking us big time. So they're going to get $100,000 not to do anything but develop a master plan for trails, walking trails, things like this at the Daniel Boone Homestead that may never materialize, may never happen for years, if at all. Uh, it's ridiculous. And then I'd like to talk about the budget, uh, but it is, uh, you know, it's a joke, as we see with all the other budgets. We came in for the past four years, maybe five years, spending more than we brought in in revenue. So how do they do this? Well, they, they just passed another budget for 2020. I'm sorry, 2021. And I'm sure 2020 is going to be the same way. We're going to come in negative. I bet the house on this. Because if you look at the videos again and the minutes, they're just spend, spend, spend. And right now they're spending tons of money on the golf course because we've got three guys on the board who are there for one singular purpose. They're golfers and they love the golf course and I can prove it. And it's Dave Spies, it's uh, Greg Galtier, and the ringleader now is Joe Stobb. It's all about the golf course. The golf course, even though Staub keeps presenting these reports claiming that it's making a, a lot of money, is, is false. It's lo we're losing money. The money maker was a food and beverage business, and they have spent virtually zero money on getting that uh, business up and running. Uh, it's golf, 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 because that's what they do. And they were members of an organization that uh, heavily supported the golf course. And what they've done is they've got elected and they've got control of our golf course. I've got big plans for that golf course. And these guys better watch out. They're in office now. We can't recall them, but we can neutralize them and we can watch what they're doing and put a magnifying glass on them. So those are the things I wanted to talk about. 
uh, for this, this meeting. Uh, you'll see two slides coming up before uh, we go into their, uh, uh, their meeting on November 9th. And uh, I try to do the best I can. I took their, their summary of, of government activities uh, and you will see what's going on. Increases in expenses, overspending like you've, you've never seen before leaving us with uh, over $4 million in spending over uh, revenue and uh, a combined uh, year over year over $11 million that they had to sp sell the sewer plant to cover this. For example, if uh, I don't think very many people noticed it, but the lawsuit for Viva was dragging on and on and on. Also, the promenade when they announced they were going to purchase this. They waited. All these things finally ended when we sold the sewer plant. We settled the lawsuit right after we sold the sewer plant because we had the money. They knew we were going to lose. It was just delay after delay, incurring more legal fees. But as soon as the sewer plant was, was sold and we received the money, the lawsuit was settled. With the promenade, they raided the uh, CD, the money that was in the sewer plant to pay off debt and to fix the, uh, the plant if necessary. They raided that really early. They took it a year before and used those, that money to pay off the, uh, to buy the promenade and then to uh, subsidize the, the deficit spending. Our township, if you look at these numbers and you pay attention and you're serious and you're concerned about our community, these four boys, the boys club I call them, are, their spending is out of control. They can't stop, they don't even care. Look at the way they treat me and others who have criticisms. I'm a, I'm a member of this community, but they treat me really, really bad. You see it in the videos. You'll see a video that I have on ExeterUnited.com where Dave Spies and John Cusadis uh, make an attempt to get the board to vote against hearing my, my public comments, which we're allowed to give. Three minutes, but we're allowed to do that. He tried to stop that. It's clear. So they're trying to suppress us. The other people who whoever come forward, uh, they intimidate and scare, so they just they don't deal with it. They say, forget about it. But we have a serious problem. Not only are our supervisors corrupt and inadequate, inexperienced, uh, unattainable to the general public, unless, they're good, unless you're good buddies of theirs and you support their efforts, believe that they're doing the right thing, but we also have now, in my estimation, my opinion, we've hired a manager who's incompetent. He was fired from two other places where he worked, I am told. Uh, he has limited experience, particularly with the uh, township our size and with the money that we have. But even worse, when Granger was here, he hired people who were not qualified to do jobs in our administration. And he did this on purpose because since he knew more than they did, they always had to come to him. They always had to rely on him. Our finance director is pitiful, totally uh, inexperienced and inadequate for the job that she's doing. And we'll see that in the future. Things are gonna come out. And uh, if they think that they can talk it away, let them try to dissuade everyone otherwise. But I have, the information, I have the facts, and I will reveal the fraudulent activity that occurred in our township recently. Now the Board of Supervisors, they have two choices. They can either fire her immediately, because when you see what I have, you're just gonna shake your head. And if they don't fire her immediately, then we know that they support this fraud, and they will go down with her. So this township is in 
trouble, big time trouble. And they're going to continue spending. They're going to blow over $20 million on the promenade. And now we're finding out, which we always knew, that you can't put everything up there like they were telling us. It looks like the fire station is out of the deal, and it looks like the community center is out of the deal. There's not enough room up there. So we're going to spend 20, probably closer to 25 to $28 million to build new digs for the police and administration. And they want an indoor walking track. Can you imagine that? And who knows, maybe they'll still finagle the Olympic-sized swimming pool in there and a food court with at least three vendors. My plan is a lot different. We keep the facility that we have now. It's all paid off. We don't owe any money on that. We need to put some money in to bring it up to date because they deferred maintenance while running all these deficits. But we turn that whole place over to the police department and a little portion of it for the highway because they, they kind of work together. And then we lease. There's a lot of uh, cheap lease uh, space around here that we can lease for our administration and engineering. And with COVID-19, things will change dramatically. Many of these people can work at home at least maybe uh, half the, the week. So we're going to need less and less space. We need to improve our systems, which they've completely ignored. The accounting in this township is deplorable, but they like it that way because then they have an excuse. I'm not just asking you to get more involved with your community. I'm begging you. You need to start looking at this stuff. You need to start asking the hard questions and don't listen to their pathetic answers. Recently, as I watch these meetings, and they're very difficult to watch, it's like I'm watching baby talk. And I want you to think about this, the, the innocuous comments by uh, John Casadas constantly attacking the only member on the board that knows what's going on, Michelle Kircher. She's got 20 some years of experience in government, 12 years as a former supervisor here. And none of them combined have that much experience, yet they believe they know better than she does. She's very kind and somewhat quiet, but when she brings up an issue, they shut her down. And you see John Casadas attacking her constantly. And I think that tells you pretty much about the attitude that the board has to all of us. If you criticize, if you challenge them, you are the enemy and they, and they sick their dog, their attack dog, Casadas on us. This man suffers severely from a narcissistic personality disorder. And he cannot take a challenge He's not kind. He wants respect, but he's not going to give it to you. So we have a very uh, severely uh, mentally ill board of supervisors who are just spending, spending, spending out of control. These master plans were developed years ago before COVID-19. And correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure you've experienced it, but COVID-19 has changed everything. These master plans are, not, are no longer relevant. We need to think new. We need to think outside of the box. We need to think for our community. They're gonna spend all this money that we have left over from the sewer plant to build these brand new buildings that are unnecessary. If we can't stop the raising of the promenade building, we could still, uh, sell off lots up there later on for development. We will get our money out of that, but I don't think we should be building any new buildings. I think the police department would be very happy having that facility over there. We can expand on it. We can make it very comfortable for them. And administration can be anywhere. So I hope you take my comments to heart. I hope you enjoy these next two slides. The first, they're both from the uh, management discussion and analysis, so it's their stuff. And I, and I try to elucidate it a little bit for you in common terms 
so that we can all understand it. Something that the Board of Supervisors should have done in this meeting. Thanks for listening to me and have a happy holiday. This slide is a copy of the page 10 of the 2019 audit. Uh, this particular slide is prepared by management. It's on page 10 of their management discussion and analysis. Uh, their analysis uh, runs from page 6 to page 17. Uh, we're looking at this particular uh, document. I've had to slice it up to fit in this slide, but it basically is showing us the governmental activities for 2018 compared to the most recent audited period of 2019. Uh, you will see that uh, we have a $2 million increase in revenue from 2018 to 2019. Uh, primarily, this increase is due to charges for services. These services uh, are uh, permits, uh, fees that have been increased uh, over the year. In addition, some of this is probably also increased activity. But this uh, changes from year to year. And we are limited to how many, how much we can increase the fees that we charge. But five hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars of the two million increase is related to these service charges. And then we have operating grants, four hundred and thirty-five thousand uh, dollars, and the increase came from uh, operating grants and contributions. The contributions were minimal. The grants are the big thing. Uh, and the problem with that is they're in intermittent. Uh, we may not, with COVID-19, obtain uh, the same level of grants. Contributions are almost non-existent. So uh, how this can continue, it's, it's, it's a very variable revenue item. The next item, number three, is interest income. This increased $454,000 due primarily to the sale of the proceeds of the sewer plant. Uh, it went from $191,000 to $646,000. Significant increase considering that that was the only about the fourth quarter that we earned this interest on the proceeds. Then we also had an increase of uh, $542,000 for the proceeds from the sale of assets. I'm not aware of any large assets that we sold other than a sewer plant. And I believe that this is simply a transfer from sewer plant proceeds into these governmental activity funds, the general fund significantly, to, uh, to balance uh, the budget. So that's where that came from. And so our revenue increased $2 million. But now let's look at the expenditure side. You can see that expenditures increased by $4.2 million. So in 2019, we had $15.9 million in revenue, uh, which included uh, from sources that are variable. But we spent $20 million. So we had expenditures that exceeded revenues by $4.1 million. We can see this situation also occurred in 2018, where we had $13.7 million in revenue, but we spent $15.8 million, which resulted in a $2 million deficit of spending over revenue. The areas that increased uh, in expenses are number five, uh, general government, that increased $1.7 million from $2.2 million to almost $4 million. This represents government growth, hiring more people, paying them more money. It, it just doesn't stop. It gets higher and higher and higher governmental costs. So we're going to have to find a way to cut these expenses. And... Item number six, 
our public safety, that's increased $2 million from $8.5 million to $10.5 million. This is related to police and fire departments. Uh, and I don't know the details on this, but we'll have to uh, look deeper into it, but it's a significant increase. So between those two uh, increases in spending, those were the significant ones, and th that caused the overspending by four point, almost $4.2 million. But it's worse than that. If you combine the last two years spending over revenue, we spent $6.2 million more than the amount of revenue that we brought into through the township through taxes and fees and also uh, clearly uh, contributions from the sewer plant. So $6.2 million negative. We can't continue spending money like this. And uh, you'll see that in number seven. And in number eight, uh, what I want to show you is item A, B, and C. And first of all, uh, item A, you can see that we transferred in over $79 million. This is the money that saved us by selling the sewer plant. Otherwise, we would have huge deficits. And you can see that in item B, where the net position at the beginning of the year was almost $12 million. But thank you, uh, item C, because of the transfer, the sale of the sewer plant, we were able to have a net positive position of almost $64 million. But the thing that we have to be concerned about, if you look at I, uh, 2018, they exceeded uh, revenue by $2 million. They transferred in $7.3 million. This money came from the sewer fund. It was a, a CD that was on deposit. It was... Uh, supposed to be used to pay off either the debt or improvements in the sewer plant. They raided this uh, money, uh, misappropriated it, because they needed to cover this deficit and they also needed the two million plus dollars to buy the promenade and they didn't have the money so they had to take this money. But you can also see uh, looking at line B for 2018, uh, we were at the beginning of the year, 2018, we had a deficit of almost $26 million. And at the end of the year, we had almost $21 million deficit. This is beyond financial mismanagement by the supervisors. And uh, it's a number of, of problems. They, they, don't, they love to spend, spend, spend. They do not know how to control spending. They do not know how to stay within the budgets that they created. And we have a workforce in administration that is way overpaid, completely overpaid. And that's where you can see the general government increases at 1.7 million year over year. We've hired more people. We pay them, we pay them salaries that are equivalent of public service, public, uh, not public service, uh, public corporations for profit. This is unheard of in government at this level, but we have many people earning uh, close to $100,000 a year, and the problem is that they are severely underqualified. So we, we take a hit in both areas. The, uh, the supervisors uh, like to spend, spend, spend. They prevent myself and other people who are concerned about this from stating their their concerns and they treat us like uh you know we, we we really don't know what we're talking about but i've i've been involved in over 250 audits and i could tell you that this report card is an f minus and uh, it actually is uh, gross negligence on a part of our supervisors and i think uh uh, it goes beyond malfeasance on their part. So we need to let them know that we're unhappy, we're extremely unhappy about this, and they should actually resign. Uh, we can't continue operating this way. And because uh, they sold the sewer sale, which fixed the overspending and allows them to implement the master plan that they've developed, uh, 
they're going to keep spending. They're going to spend until all of our money is gone. And you can see from the numbers here on A, B, and C that they had to sell the sewer plant to cover up the mismanaged finances and uh, also to try to carry out this insane master plans that they've developed along with uh, Simone Collins while uh, Mr. Granger and, and Lisa Vanderlane was in charge of the township. So they'll be gone and we'll be holding an empty bucket and you can expect taxes to rise significantly in the future because we can only raise uh, service charges so much. Uh, when we get grants, those are, have to be spent specifically for something and we have to match part of those grants. Uh, interest income will drop because we're not going to have any money in the bank and sale uh, proceeds from the sale of assets well the only thing we have left is the running country club and we can end up selling that at a significant loss so uh, the takeaway on this should be that the township supervisors are severely mismanaging our finances and if you don't stand up and voice voice your concerns about this it's going to get worse and if you want to stay in exeter township you're going to pay dearly for that privilege. Hope you enjoyed my presentation. I'm going to follow this up with a, hopefully a brief slide on our overfunded pension plans. Don't miss that one. And then I'll connect this uh, with, uh, with the video of uh, November 9th uh, supervisors meeting so that we have it all in one place. Thank you for listening to me. This next slide, we're going to talk about the pension uh, funds that uh, the township has been funding for quite a while. This first one is the Exeter Township Pension Plan. And as you can see, there are $22,212,000 required to have in this pension fund. And uh, what the audit tells us is that we funded the, our liabilities. We have $31,158,000 in that fund. So essentially, what we've done is we've overfunded this pension plan by $8,946,000. So we've put in this pension 40% more than what was required. Now, the only reason you would do that is because uh, you're not thinking too smartly about this, you're not managing it properly, or uh, you have some corrupt ideas. Now, pension funds do get overfunded, but it's typically because uh, they outperform the expected earnings. Well, and here's the other pension fund we have. This is for employees. And you'll see here that the liability in this one is uh, just under $2 million, $1,871,000. But look at that. We have $2,610,000 uh, in in that uh, pension fund. So it's it also is overfunded by $738,000. This is another 39% overfunded. Uh, we're really using the township's money inefficiently, and essentially taking it out of our pocket and putting it into the pockets of someone else. And you'll hear people like Dave Spies claim that uh, that's because we put it in there because they can get a better return than we can. And... If they're successful, yes, that's true. If they invest badly, they can lose a lot more money. But what he contends is that if we keep it in our bank accounts, we can only earn, we're limited to earning maybe 2 3% at the most. But that's because we keep it protected. But it's our money. So we overfunded these two pension plans by $9 million. $685,315. Why would we purposely overfund the, these? Again, 
I can only think of one thing, and it's only bad, corruption. Uh, remember, John Granger, when he came here, he redid everything with the pension funds and with uh, Divit, which is an insurance uh, company that uh, he, he's been involved in, and he's been on the boards of some of these organizations that are managing our money. It's a lot of money if you look at it. We've got over $33 million in these two pension funds. And I could tell you that if we kept the money, just waited until we had to really put it in the pension fund, in one year interest alone, we would earn at 2%, $194,000. That could be used for things here in the township. This isn't just a a mistake on their part or, or something that is uh, due to their inexperience. This is gross negligence. This is malfeasance. This is the misuse of uh, our township's uh, resources. And it's uh, a violation of the public trust. And I just wanted all of you to see this and think about what's going on. Uh, this was a plan that was devised by John Casadis. He said in an earlier meeting this, in, uh, this year that he wanted to expend as many of the funds from the sewer plan as he could so that he could prevent the current or future Board of Supervisors from what he called misusing it. Well, here, here is a blatant misuse of the township's funds. These are in another party, third party hands that we have no control over it, or very little control over it. And it's way overfunded, almost $10 million. And that's outrageous. It's truly outrageous. And anyone who understands managing money understands how bad this is. And you don't do this by mistake. It's a conscious effort to do this. Because what's not in this, these numbers is that in 2020, this year, they've already put in over $300,000 more into the Exeter Township Police Pension Fund where it wasn't necessary. So what do you think they're doing? Well, at this rate, uh, uh, they're just going to get rid of all of our money and we're going to see a very large tax increases. Thank you. Okay, good to go. Thanks, Larry. Uh, I'd like to call to order the Monday, November 9th, 2020 meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Please rise for the Pledge of the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation, under God, and the Roll call. call. Mr. Staub? Here. Mr. Galtier? Here. Ms. Kircher? Here. Mr. Cusatis? Here. And I'm here. Dave Speaks. Uh, public comments. Lori? There were none submitted for agenda items. Good, thank you. We'll move to presentations, the bond refinance presentation. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, this is Jamie Schlesinger. I think Jen, Jen's putting on the screen our presentation. So with me, you'll see uh, I, we have some other attendees. Uh, we have Tim Kerr from PNC Capital Markets, who's going to serve as your bond underwriter, Mark Stein and Bill Benzing from Eckerd Siemens, who serves as your uh, bond counsel. Uh, they'll be discussing the ordinance itself. Uh, but I'll give a brief rundown of where we stand right now. 
uh, don't have a lot of major updates except for kind of we were following along with the steps of the process. Uh, obviously, at the last meeting I attended, uh, the board made some decisions on how we would proceed with regard to the, the transaction itself, which, you know, gave us the next steps to, to proceed. Uh, I'll give an you know, update on the market. Uh, you know, rates still remain quite low. Uh, we're obviously, uh, you know, continuing to move forward with the process. Uh, you know, we ha obviously had the election last week. Uh, things are, you know, obviously settling down in some capacity. Uh, we'll see what those ultimate impacts will be as, you know, things, you know, find a, a solution, uh, we'll call it. Uh, that said, uh, you know, we're certainly going to see, you know, enough demand for bonds uh, because there's, you know, certainly a number of investors that, that want this type of credit. Uh, when I say this type of credit, that's a really good you know, segue to say we actually started the process to go through the credit rating uh, process, uh, which was about a week ago. Uh, we're going to go through Moody's Investor Service, and uh, we've you know, made a pretty good case to Moody's uh, to try to get an upgrade on your credit rating. Obviously, a lot has changed over the last few years, and obviously that we want to highlight that with the credit rating agency. We're expecting to hear from them later this week. Uh, you know, we, we don't know exactly where it will go, but I, I, we, we think it's going to be, a, you know, obviously a high credit rating. Uh, you know, obviously we're all keeping our fingers crossed we can get to AAA. That would be fantastic. Uh, but you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, you know, in this in this environment, it's you know it's hard to get those those high marks. But you know, obviously, you as a township have done a, a great job of regard to your finances over the last few years. Clearly, saw in the sewer system is going to have some impacts from from a fund balance standpoint. And again, you know, we'll see where the chips fall. But uh, we we did a we did take a, a major step to getting that uh, credit rating upgrade. That said, you know, interest rates are at a good place, and uh, you know, tonight's uh, meeting is really to authorize the ordinance to give us the next final step to, on the legal side to get us to do step one and also ultimately step two of the, of the combined refinancings. Uh, the step one would occur you know, over the next couple of weeks, and step two would happen sometime in, in early, uh, early 2021. Let me turn to the next page, Jim. Just highlighting what we're going to try to accomplish here uh, from, from the public standpoint. You know, this is the debt profile right now for the for the township. Uh, there's some kind of highlighted gray area. When you look at the over com overall combined debt on, on column six, and you have this you know balloon we'll call it uh, related to the the, the 2018 taxable uh, between this issue and the refinancing of the 2015 issue, which is uh, which is really the first step here. Um, I'm sorry, the, the 2015A. I apologize. We're going to you know, refinance the, the balance of those, the, those issues of, over the next couple transactions. By doing that and using some additional cash, we're going to be able to amortize the debt uh, at the same, uh, same period, which would be in 2039, and keep your overall payments somewhere within the $750,000 range, which obviously matches uh, what you're currently paying and also kind of cleans up you know, any future uh, needs that, the, that there's going to be some you know, increases on, on your current debt, debt profile. With the interest rate environment we have, we'll, we'll, we'll think there'll be some present value savings associated with this. Uh, but overall, the, the plan here is really to kind of maintain your current payments and, uh, and lock in rates at, 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 at historic lows. You can turn to the next page, Jen. Uh, so similar to what we talked about at the previous meeting, I know this is uh, it's tough to see uh, for the, if you're going to zoom in a little bit, but uh, this is really a highlighting of what we see as the as the full plan here uh, tonight's meeting, we're going to uh, take it, uh, lock in the ordinance to do the first two steps, which are the light, uh, the the blue section, which is a column one, and the red section, which is column two. There will be two separate uh, bond issuances. Again, step one would occur, you know, uh, in the next couple of weeks, and step two would be, you know, early next year. You can see from the transaction. Uh, you'll be refinancing the, the 2015A issue. We're going to be utilizing approximately $2.3 million of, of reserves uh, with, a, with a new borrowing somewhere around the $2.8, you know, $2.9 million range. We want to know exactly what that will be until pricing, but you know, we have some assumptions here that we've made based on current market conditions. Again, the key here is looking at the big picture. Uh, we, we have a number of things we're going to do, but really these first two steps will kind of get us to a point where we'll be at that $750,000 range uh, from an annual payment standpoint. 
the, the green and purple and the and the kind of the light blue will be future transactions that we'll ask the board to consider. Um, that would, of course, happen over the next coming months. But again, we want to look at big picture here uh, to, to give you an idea of what we hope uh, your, your payments will be once it's all said and done. Any questions on this page? I know you've seen this before, but uh, nothing really has you know, changed uh, based on where the market is right now. And obviously, we want, we want, to, we want to get there as, as quickly as possible. Okay. You can turn to the next page, Jen. Just as an update, as I mentioned, you know, we're, we're about halfway through the steps uh, on, on, on tonight's meeting. You know, we're asking you to approve the ordinance, which would be a multi-step, uh, you know, re refinancing of those two different issuances. Again, we will come back in the near future to, to consider doing some other things. But again, these first two steps are kind of in the middle of the page. Again, we've done the rating call. We're hoping to get back, you know, late, that, that rating uh, review and, and hopefully upgrade over the, uh, by the end of the week. And if all goes well, you know, we're hoping to price sometime around Thanksgiving, whether it's before or after, depending on how quickly we turn things around. In the grand, grand scheme of things, once that happens, we'll be able to, you know, settle on the transaction and pay off the first step of bonds before the end of the year. Uh, again, locking in the rates is the most important side of things. And again, we'll think that'll be sometime around Thanksgiving. You can turn to the next page. One more. Yeah, sorry, there you go. So just kind of uh, flowing to where we're, we're heading here, and, and, and Mark and Bill will, will discuss this with regard to the ordinance, but tonight's consideration is a, what is called a parameters ordinance, which essentially means that it's going to give the finance, financing team and, and the officials to do the necessary tasks to get us to the ultimate settlement of the transaction by filing with DCD, which is the Commonwealth's uh, approval program, and ultimately issuing the bonds associated with this. As I mentioned, this is going to be multi-step. This particular parameter is already locking in and showing you what the max schedule would be for both transactions. So again, this would be the one time you'll need to do any formal approvals. You'll notice that the borrowing amount looks a little high. Uh, that is not abnormal when we're doing these type of parameters. Uh, we do this mostly because we don't have anything locked in yet. Uh, DCD, which is the Commonwealth program, you know, has us setting these interest rates and max interest payments uh, to give us the flexibility once we price the bonds. And we're only going to do this if it makes economic sense uh, for the township, but giving us the flexibility by doing with the higher amount and the higher interest rate just falls within the, the Commonwealth standards. So again, it'll look much similar to the previous pages. This is just for parameters purposes. And obviously, you know, Bill and Mark can, can answer any questions on those. So again, we're asking you to consider a $7,750,000 you know, combined transaction between the series of 20 and series of 2021 uh, issuance. That's it for me. Uh, again, just highlighting, you know, where we're at. If anyone has any questions, please ask, and I'll kind of turn it to uh, Bill and Mark uh, for them to talk about the ordinance, unless that's further down on your, on your agenda. Dave, do you want to move the, the new sure. business number one up on the agenda? Sure, it's, it makes sense to, I think, just put it together. Mm -hmm. All right. Everyone okay with that? Yeah. Uh, I just want to clarify for uh, the people that have asked me about this. We're going to save initially, but in the long run, we're going to pay more. Is that correct, Jamie? Well, none of the, the debt and the interest rates, the present value there's a present value savings on all this because we are reducing interest expense over the course of time when you discount it back to the yields. And I know that's kind of an, an odd answer to that question, but the value of money today is worth more than in the future. So right. we are reducing the interest rates over the course of time. You know, we are going to be extending the debt a little bit because you have to, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, in in 2027, there's going to be a large payment of close to $3 million. There was, already, there was going to be a plan that you had to extend that debt out. Anytime you extend debt out, you're going to pay more interest expense over time. So, again, naturally, it's, it's going to happen. You know, we think from a present value standpoint, you're going to save close to $700,000 once it's all said and done. So I would say from a present value standpoint, there are savings. Would it be better to just 
since we have cash to pay it off and then we don't have to worry about these? Well, we have a delicate balance here of using cash versus planning for the future. And the way we thought about it from a financial standpoint was there's going to potentially be some you know, future capital needs you know, over the next you know, 20 or so years of the township uh, that you may be considering. Because of the interest rate environment we're in, we feel that hedging you know, a portion of, of the debt over the course of time makes a lot of sense. You know, we'll be locking in rates in you know, probably in the, in the low 2% range. Uh, we think over a 20-year period, I think that's a good bet um, for, for the township. And then obviously you can use your, your reserves over the course of time to internally arbitrage. You know, over the course of time, maybe over the next you know, 19, 20 years, if you earn over 2%, I think you're going to be a, a winner there. On top of that, you know, having those reserves certainly, certainly has value for, uh, for the township. So I think it's a delicate balance on, on the considerations here to util, utilize the $2.3 million and utilize that at the same time. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. You're welcome. Hey, Jen, what's the, uh, the current rates on some of those are, uh, are three and a half to 4%. Is that correct? Jamie, do you have it? On the yeah, yeah, I don't, think, I don't think they're on there. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Um, I, yeah, you're, you're going to be in the, in the, actually, yeah, hold on one second. I was going to open up a, a spreadsheet. It's going to be in the three and a half to four percent range. There's certain maturities that definitely have, right. you know, uh, coupons of that size, of, of that amount. So yeah, you're. It won't be all that way, but uh, definitely there's some that are there in that in that category. So yeah, I think we're going to have yields somewhere in the kind of the, the low twos once it's all said and done. You know, our, our viewpoint is you have long term debt. You know, sometimes there's a there's a value in amortizing it over over a period of time, and I, and I think that the township's doing a a smart move to use both reserves and, and debt at the same time. So Joe, I thought you were going to put this in a mortgage context of going down a percent and a half on your home mortgage of what that means. Well, there, there's, there's two things that I looked at it when we, when we look at these bond refinances is what is the interest rate and, and can we reduce it? And then two, the, the biggest thing that I saw too was just the leveling of the debt. I think it was five or six years where we were significantly above that 750. And the one where we had that, uh, I think it was two point four million dollars, where the where the balloon came due, or where we had to refinance that. So by by doing this and putting some money in there, it keeps the debt level in the seven twenty to seven fifty range, where we can properly plan it without. I think we kept it. It was two thousand thirty nine, Jamie. I'm trying to. That's correct. That's yeah, correct. It's so, the same maturity you currently have. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're not extending it. We're actually lowering it, and then we're leveling it too because. That twenty-five to thirty-one range, we were, we would have had to use money anyhow. So exactly. all we're doing is taking advantage of lower interest rates. At least that's the way I looked at it. Correct. Exactly right. And, and just to jump in, um, the the the, the series in twenty fifteen A, which is this first step, uh, interest rates would range between two and three point six percent. The second series that will refund um, th that issuance because it's a it's a taxable instrument. Uh, which is the 2018, uh, that, that's going to be a much higher rate. That's going to be in the 4% in the category. So, yeah, yeah, I would say from a blended rate, you can, you're probably going to be in the mid to high high threes once it's all said and done that, yeah. you, would have, that you would have had outstanding. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. I think we need to move to uh, Bill and Mark from Eckerd Siemens. We'll be actually presenting the parameters ordinance. That is what we are looking to consider adopting tonight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm, it's appearing as Maurice Seth Benzing, probably, and I don't know if you have my video up or not, but um, I'm Bill Benzing. I'm with my colleague, Mark Stein, and we have prepared for your consideration the ordinance um, that you all should have received. And, you know, as Jamie went over, really what the ordinance is doing is uh, authorizing the maximum amount of bonds of $7,750,000 uh, to refund uh, both the 2015A bonds of the township and uh, the Township's General Obligation Note Series of 2018. Um, the ordinance also authorizes um, the sale of the new bonds to PNC Bank, um, sets forth all the, the numbers that Jamie has shown in his schedule, the maximum interest rate, the maximum principal amount that will be coming due in each year, uh, the maximum debt service in each year. Uh, 
Uh, it provides you with the form of the bonds and also sets forth a number of kind of uh, ancillary things uh, authorizing the preparation of certain documents um, required by state law for filing and uh, a number of closing documents um, that are required to be executed and delivered in order to um, sell and then close on and issue the bonds. Um, you know, happy to take any specific questions you guys may have. Yeah, yeah I don't have any at this time. If, if, yeah, if there are no questions, I mean, it would be appropriate to have a roll call vote um, so we can record, you know, the, the full vote of the board on it. We're okay to do that now or we do that under new business? I would defer that to Liz, but I think, you know, I'm okay with doing it now. Sorry about that. You can do that now. That's fine. Sure. Uh, look, look, look. Yep. So, yeah. call vote. I'm, I'm fine with adopting the multi series parameter refunding ordinance. Bill, do we need a motion first? Motion. Yeah, a motion, a second, second, and then a vote would be appropriate. Okay, I'll revise that to make a motion to adopt the multi-series parameter refunding ordinance. Second. Any further discussion or questions on this? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. I'm opposed. I may, when I see the other numbers, I may think differently. Okay. Order one, we adopt the ordinance for refinance and needs to move forward. Anything else okay. you need there, Jen or Jamie or? Uh, I have nothing else if Jamie and Mark and Tim and Bill are fine. I think we're good, thank you. Now, thank you everybody. We'll keep your, keep your fingers crossed. We hope to have some good news on credit rating. And uh, obviously Jen and Jeff will, will communicate that with the board. Uh, when, the, when the time comes. Thank you, everybody. Hey, Jamie, one, one quick question before you run out. If we don't get to sure. AAA and we're uh, probably one notch below that, what do you think the difference would be in basis points, just a ballpark? Five. Okay. Five or so basis points. I'm holding you to I mean, five. Being in a, being a, <laughs> yeah. Five, I, you know, I mean, having that color rating in the, in the, in the stature of this term, you know, is, I, I think, you know, obviously PNC and, and I know Tim's on the phone, um, you know, will we'll tell you that that's, that's going to be very strong one way or the other. You're going to, you're going to find plenty of, uh, you know, buyers when you have this kind of high credit worthiness. Right. So if it was going out like, you know, 30, 40 years, and maybe that's a, a different story, but you know, this is relatively short. Um, so hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll, I hope to get the AAA obviously, but, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay. Thank you. Well, well, thanks, Mark and, and Bill and Jamie. I mean, a, a lot of good work here. I mean, it's always nice to save some money. Uh, so a lot of good work. Yeah, I, think, I think it's a good, it's a good plan here. So, you know, you'll, you'll be seeing us over the next few months. Uh, we'll get these, these completed and then, you know, we have those next steps and, and, you know, hopefully we'll be within the ranges that we're talking about here. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks all. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark and Bill and Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Very good. Move on to regular approvals. Uh, the minutes, October 26, 2020. I'll make a motion to approve the regular minutes, October 26, 2020. I'll second. Any further discussion or questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Minute to the special budget meeting, November 2nd, 2020. I move that we approve the minutes of the special budget meeting dated November 2nd, 2020. I'll second. Thanks, Greg. Any further discussion? I'm gonna abstain, Dave, since I wasn't there. Oh, good. Got you. That's for Lori for your note taking. Thank yep. you. This is the abstention. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Disbursements, November 9th, 2020. 
I move that we approve the disbursements uh, from November 9th, 2020. I'll second. Any further discussion? Joe, I mean, I think you had a few questions that uh, Jen was going to cover. Just, just a couple things for Jen. Sure. Uh, we had a Fox Rothschild bill for September. It was for about $4,000. Um, the items that they are covering are just the cleanup or follow-up on um, some things that, that were handled by them uh, previously. Um, some of the topics were right-to-know requests and appeals. Um, they're handling a, a Birdsboro Power letter of credit switch issue, um, the traveler's bond claim, of course, and also some Sunshine Act issues. Um, all these, like I said, are in the finalization stages. Um, so this is kind of just wrapping up their work from previously. Um, there was a $98,000 bill for her signals. This was for a traffic signal upgrade as, um, on Perkyoman Avenue. It was part of the Perkyoman Ave project. And this is actually grant reimbursable for through the Greenlight Go grant. Um, I think that actually is all of the questions that you had, Joe, for the disbursements. Correct. So we're going to handle the rest of them later. Yep. Thank you. Any further discussion or questions for Jen or anyone else? Um, all in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jen. Uh, unfinished business, the monthly golf report. This report you know, has been uploaded to the website uh, for review. Um, I guess I'll defer to golf committee. Any comments or? Just, I mean, the, I mean, the numbers continue to be impressive. The, the rounds are up month over month and year over year. Um, uh, very, very strong October, Dave. I think you had the historical numbers that said it was as strong or stronger than it has been. And I'm sure based on the, the weather for November, we probably are going to have another strong month. So again, just the, the numbers have been very, very impressive out of the club. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. When I look back over old records and yeah, fantastic on the revenue, the course condition rounds and just general feedback from the public, it's, it's been a good year. So hopefully, we continue that, and you know, I think some of the stuff that was done on the course and um, is paying off. So, any other comments from anybody, Jeff, or anyone else? Mm -hmm. Very good. Monthly right to know report. This is also like the golf report, uploaded the website for review. Um, Jeff, I'll leave it to you to comment, but I will say, you know, certainly all responses filled in less than five days, nothing outstanding, great response time. I noticed the monthly cost is down. So Jeff, I don't know if you have any other comments than that. No, there really isn't. Um, we've cleaned them all up. Um, there's still a few outstanding issues that are with the office of open records, but those are appeals but the regular right to know requests are all been completed and we don't have any outstanding. Yeah, it's great work by the team. Comments from anyone else? No, just again, you said it, everything is five days or I believe it's five days or under, which is fantastic. And it appears that um, there's no backlog. So well, well done, thank you. New business, item number one, consider a doubt. Oh, we guess we've already covered that. We'll skip over that. We don't have to cover anything else on that, Jim. No, we covered that item. We are good to no. move on. We're good. Okay, item number two, consider adopting a resolution uh, establishing the procedures for the procurement of professional services for the pension systems with, in accord with Act 44 of 2009. Laurie, can you move the agenda, please? Oh, thank you. Liz, would you mind handling this? Sure, sure. So there was a finding in uh, the auditor's report following the audit of the township's three pensions. And this is not unusual. Um, so a lot of municipalities do not realize that there's new requirements under Act 44 regarding the retention of professionals performing pension-related duties. 
and after um, this act was established, you need to establish these policies by resolution. And um, unfortunately, the township did not have these policies and a resolution in effect. So the auditor, you know, they look for that. But like I said, it's nothing to be concerned about. It's just um, something that a lot of municipalities overlook. Uh, as a result of the finding in the auditor's report, we did prepare uh, the resolution along with the policies for the township. We also supplied those documents to the auditor's office so that they felt comfortable with what we had provided to them. They reviewed them and they also advised us that the documents addressed their findings so that the township would, is, is fine now. Um, but you need to uh, make a motion to adopt this resolution tonight. Just as a little bit of additional backstory, I believe, Liz, this act went in, in of course, 2009, it appears. It was pre-2016 when anybody who was actually on this, this uh, meeting worked for the township. So that's, this that's correct. Right. Yeah. This was supposed to be done a while ago, and unfortunately, it was caught in the audit that we just had, which was uh, auditing the years of 2016 through 2019 for the three pension plans. Yeah, and it, and it you know it's sort of hidden in there. So so Jen makes a good point. It it was established years ago, but but it's not unusual for townships still to be getting this report in their auditors' findings every year that they might have you know uh, not have included this resolution in their policy. So it, it's it's not unusual and it's nothing to be worried about. But uh, it it was an act that was passed several years ago before this board was here or you were here or I was here <laughs> so Perfect. yeah so again no no penalty and this is just a resolution to the issue that's correct okay yeah just a little bit of housekeeping okay well can this is once and done and unless they change it again we don't have to do it every year that's correct you're good to go thank you you're welcome very good thanks So we need a motion. Yes, you do. I move that we adopt the resolution establishing the procedures for the procurement of professional services for municipal pension systems in accord with Act 44 of 2009. I'll second. Any further discussion or questions? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. Item number three under new business, consider approval of accepting the escrow for engineering zoning and solicitor reviews for amendment for township common zoning district. Uh, Dave, this is um, for an applicant that township staff uh, have been talking with. The applicant would like to propose um, additional zoning language if the board would agree, um, an escrow account would be set up, which they would put in um, put in money for township uh, staff, including the engineer and solicitor, in order for uh, staff to provide um, review and uh, comment uh, to the applicant at no cost to the township. Thanks, Will. Could you do that again, Will? I <laughs> It's a, it sounds to me like, well, if I can sum it up, or maybe Jeff can, it sounds like he has, he, he, the applicant wants to put in money for us to consider an adjustment to our township zoning district. There's no obligation and there's no cost for us to consider that. Correct. And and they're going to be putting, they would like to put in a an escrow in the amount of $2,000. Uh, this is a typical situation uh, where a developer just would like the township to consider some zoning changes, which Joe and Will and I discussed this. It, these changes are included in other municipality uh, ordinances for financial subdivisions. Um, and we, we do believe that it might be beneficial for the township to have this in their zoning ordinance, this language that they're going to be proposing. However, it's going to be at no cost um, to the township, as Will pointed out. 
and the planning commission would get to review it too, the engineer, uh, zoning officer, and our office. And, and then if we feel that it would be ready and it is beneficial, then we would suggest that it would go to the supervisors. But again, this escrow account would, they, you would utilize money out of that account to pay for that, these, for our review, the engineer's time and the zoning officer's time. And if it goes below $500, it will be replenished again up to $2,000. So it will be at no cost to the township. Will, could you explain for the board um, exactly what they're looking to do, what a financial subdivision uh, that they're discussing doing? Yes, so the township, um, the Exeter Commons has a sketch plan um, before the planning commission currently, which um, it, a new thing which uh, shopping centers are doing or proposing to subdivide um, the entire shopping center up into individual buildings and lots. Um, the, we call this a financial subdivision. There's a couple other names for it. Um, it's essentially for the shopping center owner to either sell off um, individual lots or some other motive, um, you know, with, with the reduction of um, uses for brick and mortar stores. Um, Liz can maybe attest to this, that it's, it's, we're seeing a lot more of this with uh, the larger shopping centers. And one thing I just want to add with the financial subdivision, you're still going to have to have cross easements for access uh, and so forth. And basically what it looks at is it looks at the whole entire track to meet zoning, but gives relief, as Will said, to subdivide a building as a separate parcel. It still would need to have access easements and so forth. This has been coming more common. I do think it's due to the, um, the economics. A lot of shopping centers and other municipalities are starting to see this. Um, actually, Target is already under its own separate ownership. That occurred when Exeter Commons was developed because that's the only way Target would come in to that shopping center. So we're starting to see a lot of this throughout the county, uh, especially in Exeter, and there's a good chance we might see it possibly at the pro, um, at the uh, promenade or not the promenade, I'm sorry, or Shelbourne or other, other Reading Mall and so forth. So essentially they're going to put together some language. We'll have that opportunity to review it and critique it and, and, and work with the planning commission and the board. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Liz. So Jeff, you're comfortable with considering this? Yeah, I, this is fine. This way it guarantees there is money set aside to make sure that the engineering and uh, legal fees are being reimbursed um, without going back and billing every time they have a meeting. Um, the, the money will just come out of the escrow account. And as um, uh, Liz mentioned, if it goes below $500, they were required to replenish that account. Do they have to still pay their fees? So or yes. Yes, if they, if they would submit a, 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 a sketch plan or preliminary plan, any they would have to pay the typical review fees that you charge okay. for review of those plans. And the ultimate decision is going to be made by the um, supervisors? That's correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Currently, if they go ahead with the subdivision, they would be need multiple... Uh, variances from the zoning hearing board this will allow for more or less a reduction in that amount currently the way our ordinance is written they would need um relief from all the side yards and the impervious coverage relief if they if they choose to try to uh, go that route very good i'll make a motion to approve for approval of accepting the escrow for engineering zoning and solicitor reviews for the township common zoning district for the amendment for the township common zoning district. We need the dollar amount in there, Dave, the 2000 and the 500. 
I would add that. That would be good if you could add that to yeah, that. Yeah, it, it doesn't get out. It doesn't get out of control. In case. Yep. We'll make a move for the approval of the accepting the escrow in the amount of two thousand dollars for uh, for review replenishment as it gets down to five hundred dollars. Second that. Any further discussion or questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Joe. Item number four. Consider approval of demolition bid for Exeter Promenade Shopping Center at 3925 Perkiomen Avenue. Jeff or Clarence, I don't know who's going to... Well, the, the project was put out to bid. Uh, Great Valley Consultants uh, did the bid specs and coordinated the, the bidding. Um, we received uh, bids from eight companies, um, and uh, the low bid came in at $187,000. Um, Wargo Enterprises from um, Akron, New York, was the low bidder. They meet all the qualifications and all their documentation is, is correct. Um, we would like to, at this time, have the board authorize uh, the uh, awarding the contract to them. Uh, this is to do the demolition of the Promenade Center. This will um, take care of the main building and the strip mall section all the way out from Giant over to, I believe it was Blockbuster Video. Um, that will be demolished. The lower level buildings will be demolished after those leases expire in September of 21. Um, but this will move the project ahead. Um, the tenants um, that were in those um, buildings up there have all relocated um, and um, we're ready to move ahead with this process. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, questions, anyone? I mean, I was just gonna say, just for clarification, I mean, I think the condition those buildings are in, no matter what the future of this property is, this is a necessary move. And from the estimates we had, this is an extremely good price. I have uh, two questions, Dave. Um, uh, Jeff, one, if, if the bid would be approved, um, is there a certain time frame uh, that that's in place as far as delaying it? If we approve this, it, it's, it's a contract and we're paying it? Is that the first one? They would, um, they would probably not get started until uh, sometime in December um, till they got – you know, all their um, final paperwork, their bonding um, approved and everything um, and mobilized. Uh, so it would probably be December. Um, Joe, am I correct on that? Um, yeah, yes, because legally we have to give them at least 10 days to return uh, the executed bonds and, and certificate of insurance until we review that and send that to Liz's office um, until they get everything started. Most realistically, it'll be early, Dece early to mid-December. The, the second question, I know the architect was taking a look at options for that location as well as our current location as far as options. Um, wouldn't it, would it be best to wait to see if they say there is any? And look, I've, I've seen the buildings. I've, I'm not disagreeing with what Dave said. I went through them as well. As far as any of that structure being able to be used, I, I doubt it, but I'm just asking. Well, uh, I'll jump in ahead. Um, just something I was going to announce uh, at the end of the meeting that uh, KCBA architects um, will be doing a presentation at our next board meeting. And um, they have been up at the site. They have gone through through the, the entire site, as well as doing the feasibility of our current facilities. And um, they're, they're in concurrence that um, it, it's shot. Those buildings are shot. They are not reusable. Um, it would cost a uh, ridiculous amount of money to try and rehab those buildings. And they really don't fit our needs of what we're pro um, proposing to do for a new municipal complex. So um, they're well aware of, of, of that situation. And when we told them uh, that we had gone out to bid for the demolition, they, they totally agreed with us and said that's, that's a good first step. Um, it gives them an even better clean slate to look at as part of the uh, concept of, of relocating the complex up there. Jeff, 
Um, does it, are they hauling away all the material too? It's all, it's all included in that. They will, they'll put up the fencing around it. Um, they will uh, demolish the building and remove it as they go. Um, some contractors just bulldoze the whole thing and, and then remove it. They're planning on removing it, I believe, as they tear it down um, so it doesn't look as bad and it keeps the, um, the mess under control a little bit. Um, they are from New York. Um, we discussed that with them and they understand that their bid was a correct bid. They felt very comfortable in doing it. Uh, just to give you an idea, the bids, uh, they ranged from the low bid of 187,000 um, on up to the high bid of 497,000. Um, and they just kind of were very evenly spaced from the bottom to the top. Um, in earlier estimates, uh, a lot of people have thrown around a million dollar price tag uh, to take the building down. So um, this is actually very good. And we also saw a very similar low number on the PennDOT bidding that was done for taking down the Radio Shack building. Um, that building is uh, right around 25,000. So I think there's good competition with the companies out there at this time. Uh, it's it's good work for them heading into the, the winter season. They can do demolition and not have to worry about protecting things um, with, under construction uh, protocols. And, and they have a contract, a, not a contract, but an agreement with uh, Morgantown. And that's where the, uh, the track is gonna be going. To, yeah. And they, and they were at the site too, which makes us feel better that they at least saw it. Um, they're not just bid blindfoldedly, but Clarence is right. They have a relationship with Republic and they've done work in this area before. Thank you, everyone. And, and Jeff, Jeff or Clarence, I mean, so, you know, if we go forward, you know, with this and you're putting up fencing around our property line and start tearing down any impact on neighbors i mean do we need to, the houses up behind there the anyone yeah. else we got a lot of notifications to do or we uh we, we met with uh, ugi today um uh, about the gas lines they are going to well they already started today actually tearing out all the the gas line meters behind uh, all these stores they are going to come back and dig out and disconnect so that that whole line that runs along the back parallel of the strip mall will be just a, a main, which runs really just to uh, supportive concepts. Uh, so at that time, at some point, they need to be notified that depending on what we do, their gas line may have to get moved since it's, it's on our property. Um, the same issue is going to be with the water line, which will definitely come into play because that runs along the front of the mall, strip mall, uh, and they're what they're using our water, so uh, that they're definitely going to have to run a, a water line coming off of 422 or something. Now they do have a right of way coming in and out for their vehicles, but that's all they have. They don't have anything for uh, the utilities. So if a fencing goes up or whatever, we start tearing down, is there, I, I, not, not picturing it right now, but like supportive concept and others that go through that parking lot, will they be cut off or be able to get there? They will be able to get their cars in. There'll be a lane left there for them to get in and out. Okay. What, ab what about like the dry cleaner and the muffler? Company? Yes, they will be able to all as well. It'll, it'll circle that whole area there. Okay. Very good, thank you. So we I'll make a motion to award Wargo Enterprises in the amount of $187,000 for demolition of the Promenade Shopping Center, 3925 Perpioman Avenue. I'll second. Any further discussion or questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I just have it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Item number five, award contract for Daniel Boone Homestead Master Plan to Simone Collins in the amount of $99,945. Uh, 
uh, Lori or Jeff, I think you said some follow up from last meeting. Sure, yeah, I can cover this. Um, I, uh, I put this back on the agenda because, and we discussed it at the prior meeting and the discussion was that the contract was awarded to Simone Collins and uh, we discussed my asking if they would meet the contract, uh, the uh, proposal amount that was submitted by Brandywine Conservancy. Um, I did speak with Simone Collins uh, about that and they were happy to work with us and willing to do it, but they wanted to, uh, they requested to review the other proposal first, which I thought was a reasonable request to see if there were any glaring issues where there were big differences. Um, and they submitted to us, which I shared with the board, um, the areas that they found where uh, there's their proposal was, I won't even say a little bit more expensive, but just an explanation of where the additional costs are coming from. And in my opinion, in reviewing it, it really came down to a matter of we're getting a higher level of service and we're getting more in their proposal than Brandywine included in theirs. Um, everything was pretty comparable and, and that really just makes up the what ends up ultimately being about a $1,700 difference between the two after grant reimbursement. Um, so it's just my recommendation at this point that we award the contract to Simone Collins in the amount that they proposed to us so that we don't lose any of those additional services that they had in included in their proposal. Thanks, Laurie. I mean, yeah, thanks for following up. And I think they gave a, a very good detailed explanation of the differences, which even further helped explain the, what, what they're proposing to do. I agree. I think, it was a, I think it was a better proposal in the end and more professionally done for what we need in this area. So I'll Thanks. make a motion to award the contract for Danny Boot Homestead for Lonnie Collins for the amount of 99945. I'll second. Any further discussion, comments? Well, Dave, I, I did I did question the, the difference and asked Laurie to go back. At least I was one of them that did. Yep. I appreciate it. And then when the, the information did come back, I think it, it, uh, it justifies the additional amount. There's um, hours, services uh, that certainly can justify the uh, small additional expense. So I will, I will approve. I will vote for it. Yeah. Very good. Thanks. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. One opposed? Yes. I have it. Thank you. And just to clear, this is this our portion of this grant comes out of the parks fund. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. I, item number six: Consider proposal to name an unnamed tributary of Antietam Creek as Spirit Creek. Yes, the, uh, the township was contacted um, by the United States Board of Geographic Names. Um, this is a, a somewhat of a bureaucratic organization, a naming body um, that they, they assign names to unnamed tributaries or historic areas that were just known by a local name but was never formally done. Um, this, this unnamed creek, it's a tributary into Antietam Creek. Um, it runs through mostly through, um, I, mean, I believe it's uh, Lower Alsace. Township and a small little portion of it um, uh, goes through Exeter Township before it actually goes into Antietam Creek. Um, there is no money involved. There is no uh, notifications or anything. Uh, this is something. There, what they're asking the Board of Supervisors is just to to write a letter of support saying we don't have a problem with naming it Spirit Creek. Uh, the majority of it, probably about. 85% of this little tributary runs through several pieces of private property. And the property owners felt that um, it was, had been known as Spirit Creek uh, for many years and they, they wanted to officially name it that. Um, so there's no, no, no cost to the township or, or any problem with this. Um, I've been involved in, in projects like this in the past and people just felt like they wanted to name an unnamed tributary. So uh, if the board uh, authorizes, um, I will uh, put a letter together for, on behalf of the board authorizing um, our concurrence to name it Spirit Creek. 
Thanks, Jeff. I mean, do you need, is a motion needed for this or just consensus? Just a uh, motion to authorize the manager to, um, to agree to Spirit Creek. And I'll put it in writing. I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thanks, everyone. Item number seven, discussion on the 2021 Animal Control Contract <coughs> Safety Net Sanctuary. The, the township has been using the services of Safety Net Sanctuary this year. Um, we're, we're very happy um, with their services that they have been providing on, uh, in terms of picking up uh, stray animals and reuniting them with uh, with the owners. They've had an extremely good success rate. Um, they're they're very cooperative and uh, work with us on some problem uh, issues that we're having in the township. Um, this is a uh, a proposal to contract them for a one year contract uh, beginning January first of twenty twenty one. Their price has gone up just a slight bit over last year, but they are providing. Uh, more services. They uh, just inc uh, increased the size of their facility, and the owner is also looking to um, take some additional courses on her own to be certified uh, to to take things on if we end up needing to go to court. Um, so um, the the total compensation um, will, will be uh, four thousand dollars. Plus, there is an additional item that, as part of this contract, the township would be providing um, or gifting a vehicle, an old surplus vehicle that was scheduled to go for junk. It's a, it's a decommissioned uh, police car. Uh, it happens to have the animal cage in the back. Um, uh, typically, we have not been selling these units because we're, we don't really want to put uh, old used police cars out there where people think that they're driving around in an Exeter police car. So we're doing just some minor modifications. So um, it will take anything that says Exeter off of it. Um, it normally would go to the junkyard um, uh, for scrap. And uh, as part of the, the agreement, we, we asked if she would be interested in uh, accepting that vehicle. She was thrilled with it. She uses a personal vehicle right now to go and pick up animals. Um, this would be ideal for her use. Um, it's a one-time deal. It's it's hers to use. She keeps it, um, and there are no strings attached. If it breaks or anything like that, it's uh, it's just part of the one-time part of the agreement. Um, and she had proposed the agreement being eight thousand five hundred dollars this year, which uh, was a significant jump. Um, so we agreed to $4,000 and providing her with this vehicle as a one-time um, payment, and she was extremely happy with it. Um, I think it's a fantastic deal for the township with the, with the services that she's going to provide compared to some of the other options out there that would cost us in excess of uh, $40,000 to $50,000 uh, based on per capita. Um, so I think this is a, a real good opportunity for us. Um, she's very easy to work with and um, has offered if any of the board members want to go to her facility to take a tour and take a look at it. Um, she'd be uh, thrilled to have you come out and take a look. I have a question. Will they do the microchipping again or was that a different company last year this, and that we did that, remember? We did that with the Humane Society, but we could do that again, although I don't know with COVID, they Sure, I'm talking maybe like consider, but, one or two years down but, the road. But yes, yeah. absolutely, we, we, we could do that again. That was a good event, and it also, I think, helps control the pet population. And what about feral cats? Did they mention anything about that? I, I, I know there's a lot of cats around Exeter, like massive cat. Yeah, no, nope. nobody, nobody really does anything with feral okay. cats other than um, TNR. So. Okay. Uh, the Humane Society could still help us with that. They do do that. Now, Safety Net Sanctuary will help us with, like, a clearly it's a domesticated cat that's somebody's pet. Uh, but nobody, 
the ARL isn't even doing anything with, with feral, with feral cats, cat colonies, that sort of thing. Um, the other thing that I would point out with this, and, and some of you may recall when we talked about this last year in the budget presentation, when we, when we declined to contract with the ARL, one of the big struggles that we had was transportation of animals. We, we had been over the last year and, and we've been pretty successful with it. Our residents have been really great with holding animals that they find um, and keeping them at their homes because we kind of had a little bit of a gap in our service um, as far as being able to transport because we had that period where we were able to take animals to the Humane Society, but we couldn't take them there. We had to ask the residents to take them there, which is still something that is possible to happen once they officially reopen. That's still an option if a resident wants to do that. But what Lisa Safety Net Sanctuary has changed this year is she's guaranteeing us transport for these animals at a response time of one hour, which is going to be hugely helpful for the police department. So that's a really big added benefit that we're getting this year for not very much more money. And we've had a really great relationship with her over the last year. She's been very helpful to us. Excellent, thanks. Yeah, yeah this is a good find by the administration and previous board. I may have missed it, but anybody the ARL, and you're cutting out a bit. Is, is that a typo on the agenda? Should it be in 2020? No, it would be for 2021, right, the right. contract year. It provided services to the township in 2019. Yes, that's a typo. Okay. So it should be 2020. I apparently don't know what year it is. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I did not hear what uh, Jen had said. Or, excuse me, I could not understand <laughs> what Jen said. <laughs> I think I was having some internet issues. <laughs> I, I say, I may have missed it, but did anybody mention what the ARL's proposed contract was, Laurie? Oh, the no, I did not mention that. Okay, yes. so they did send us a proposal, and it's either $1 or $2, I believe, per resident, which would amount to $25,000 or $50,000, basically. Those are the two are options that they are Our choice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, the, the service in 2020, because I remember then being in the audience as you were talking about this, the concern, um, was you, you're happy with the service that we got? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, the, the zoning department, code enforcement, um, as well as the police department, we were all in on the conversations on um, reviewing the contract, and um, they're happy uh, with the service uh, that, that they've given to the police and especially uh, our zoning department uh, to help them so they're not out chasing uh, stray dogs and cats. And uh, we had a call um, where a donkey and a, and a horse had gotten out, mm -hmm. and we contacted her and she jumped in her vehicle and was all ready to come out and, and help pick them up when luckily our police were able to corral them and get them back to their owner. But sight unseen, she, she just hooked up her horse trailer and was heading out. Um, so she really, um, very responsive. And uh, so everyone has had a good relationship working with her. Well, Jeff, if she can get a donkey in that car you're giving her, then I really want to retain it. <laughs> well, if you fold them correctly, you can put them in the back seat. <laughs> okay. I'll make a motion to award the 2021 Animal Control Contract to Safety Net Sanctuary. Do you, you need the amount and the amount of $4,000 plus the vehicle? Correct. Focus on second. John got that one? Yeah, I'll take that one. John got that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Thanks. Item number eight, discussion on the 2021 preliminary budget. Uh, John, you provided us some more information at the request of the board in last meeting. Uh, yeah, so I think you have to. You missed the big draft, so I don't you know. You missed the financials, Dave. You What's missed that? number eight. Oh, yes. Sorry. Old agenda. Oh. Yes. Oh. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. 
<laughs> yes. Uh, we and consider approving the, let's go back one, consider approving the 2019 audited financials. Uh, yeah, the, the 2019 audited financials have been finalized and provided to the township by Maley, the uh, auditor for the year 2020. Uh, 2019. Um, we sent those out the other day to all the board members for their review. Um, I can field any questions if you would like. If not, we would look for approval of the audited financials for 2019. Just, I mean, just to comment, uh, just compliment them. There was two material findings that I saw in there. Just uh, one which we had discussed, and I think we're going to be looking at taking care of it, which was the inner funds that are running at a negative balance like the the, mm -hmm. the money that was left over from the reading country club and then some um, old checks that were outstanding that had not been cashed just having something in place and then it wasn't a material finding but just recommending that we have a minimum fund balance policy so um looked at a few of these in the past and that was um, overall a very good audit Thanks, Joe. Comments from anyone else? I think that we need to take the time to remedy um, this, the suggestions that um, Bailey sent us and um, try and get everything fixed up so we don't have continued problems. Jen, you want to comment on that? I thought most sure, of them my internet in and out, but I think she was, uh, my internet's uh, funky tonight, but um, I, I think Michelle was saying about uh, remedying the, the issues. And just for clarification, they're not actually audit findings. That was in a management recommendation letter. It's not actually cited in the audit as any sort of weakness or a finding. Uh, we had no actual sightings within the audit. Um, that's just their management recommendation. Mm -hmm. So right. we are, of course, on the 23rd bringing... The, um, the fund balance issue to the board. Uh, we will have a recommendation. I'll review it a little bit later in the budget um, proceedings. And also we have already started cleaning up these stale checks, just kind of got away from us this past year with everything else that's been going on. So, and uh, we're looking in 2021 to establish um, a lot of purchasing policies. So uh, the township has not really had any financial policies in the past that we need to kind of get on top of. Yeah, I, I would point that out to Michelle. You know, if you look at the findings, you know, there was really not much compared to previous years. So great yeah. job by the team. So that was a clean audit. Yep. Wonderful right. job. Oh, and one other thing, and I know we discussed this in the past, uh, why the, the timing of this took so long this year. So this is actually the first year that the capital assets or the fixed assets are included in the, the audited financial. So if you look at prior audits, we actually had an unqualified or a qualified opinion um, only because we were not fully compliant with GASB 34. Uh, so we had done all the other accrual work to bring us into modified accrual, but except for the capital assets, which required um, that third party vendor to do evaluation. So this is the first year that we are fully compliant with GASB 34, and we are now have an unqualified opinion. So we are very clean at this point and can kind of move on with that process. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Thank questions, you. comments from the board on how you'd like to proceed, wait or approve or make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the 2019 audited financials. I will second. Further comments or discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Um, I'm opposed because I haven't finished the last couple, last few pages. So I'm opposed for now until I finish it. Aye. And I, I don't think, I, I think there were some changes too in certain laws that she wasn't aware of. So um, that wasn't practiced before. So I think that that has, ha, was worked on too. Was worked on, so thank you. Okay, thank you. So four to one, uh, audited financials for 2019 are approved. 
Thanks, Jim. Uh, item number nine, discussion on the 2021 preliminary budget. So I started to introduce this. We had some questions before. We wanted to get an early peek at the numbers and uh, Jen, you've provided us with that. So I don't know if you wanna comment or open it up to questions. Is it possible to get her summary up on the screen here? So it would be the first two pages, or yeah, go to the first page of the, the main changes, which is a very good summary and very helpful. <clears throat> uh, Laurie, do you want me to pull it up? Um, I, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Give me one second, guys. I am working on it. My Either my internet or my computer is not oh. agreeable tonight. <laughs> I can do it if, you, if it's easier. Uh, if you could, yeah, I don't know, something, and I have to log into my work computer, and things are just not going smoothly with IT today, so. Okay, just give me one second. Thank you, Laurie. No, no problem. Mm -hmm. All right, well, while Laurie's bringing that up, um, what I put together was a... It try, I tried to be short. It turned into a two-page summary of where we are with the budget. Um, so first we started with personnel. Uh, we have a few open or unfilled positions. Thank you, Laurie. Um, we have, uh, so these positions were prior positions that are just currently not filled at the moment. Most of them due to resignations or terminations. Um, we have, of course, the HR risk manager. Um, so these are all included in the current budget um, at the salaries that I have listed here. So that we have it as a $70,000 salary. Uh, there is a recreation, recreation coordinator, which I know Laurie has talked about in the past. That's what she calls her assistant. Uh, that's in at a $35,000 salary. There are actually two laborers in there in the public works department. Um, one, we are actually interviewing people currently. Clarence has sat through a couple interviews over the past couple of days or weeks. And then there's one that, like I said, we are awaiting. One of our prior seasonal employees is finishing up his trade school at the end of the year. So we're kind of hoping he may come back at that point and we will open up that position at that point. Um, we also have some police retiree replacements in there. Um, there are two um, police officers retiring next year. So Chief has some new hires slotted in May and July to replace those officers who are retiring slightly later in the year. Um, again, we save about $40,000 plus with each new officer as retirements happen and new officers come on board. Uh, we're actually not asking for any real true new positions. Um, and then we did eliminate one position, which was the fleet manager position, which we talked about at a prior meeting or two, which is approximately a $60,000 salary. Um, any questions on the personnel piece? Nope. I, I, I Just the, the one, the, um, was one of these you're thinking about doing as, as a attempt to hire, or was that from the zoning position that we'll have discussed? That's for the fire marshal position that I have a little bit later. So um, we are unsure whether that would be a part-time person or if it would be a consultant person. Um, I do have it in under wages in the engineering area, but I didn't include any benefits for that person. So I just included it so that it would capture FICA and unemployment and those types of things in case we would hire the person on a part-time basis. But uh, we have to decide whether it's part um, employee or consultant. But um, that's under the new requests for um, non-wage items, I'm going to call it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Greg, yeah. did you have something? Yeah, I, I, not a question so much as a concern. I think any time you have a, uh, a couple openings, uh, that, that gives you an opportunity to kind of take a look at how you're utilizing your staff and are we doing that in the uh, best way possible? So um, I guess that my concern is that we're just looking at, well, this is the way we've always done it. Is this necessarily the best way? I uh, called Spring Township and I called Muhlenberg Township after I spoke with Paul Jansen just to kind of get a sense of 
you know, what other townships our size were doing, neither one had a, a full-time human resources person. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I just, I just think some discussion needs to be held concerning that. Is this the, is this the best way really to go or should we take a, uh, look at some other, other possibilities? shifting some people did did we when we sold the wastewater treatment plant mm -hmm. did we um lose any staff in the finance department since then we did not um there is one person who solely worked on the sewer billing piece of it she is still as we know we have still have a large accounts receivable balance so she is still working to post payments and file liens and and work through that so about 50 percent of her time is still sewer related i will call it um we she has taken over the kind of day-to-day -day things related to hr so she is new enrollments um handling um some of the, a lot of the insurance claims, working with the insurance company, working with the health insurance company to help employees, um, you know, those sorts of things she's handling, you know, cancellation, she's handling bill processing, those sorts of things. So what we need, and the person doesn't need to be called an HR manager, but we don't currently have anybody in house who has an HR forte or background. I always say we need somebody who's going to keep us out of trouble. Um, we don't have anyone. I don't have that expertise, nor do I have the ability or the time to take on that role. We don't have anyone who has a degree in human resources, who knows the rules and regulations. So we do a lot of Google searching and just trying to manage. And it's unfortunately wasting a lot of my time, Jeff's time, Laurie's time, Clarence's time, where we could be doing our real roles. So there's a lot with HR that is checking boxes these days with documents and forms and FMLA, FMLA paperwork. And now there's COVID paperwork. So there's a lot of things. It's not just hiring and firing courts kind of things. There's a lot of check boxes that you have to um, have to go through and, and make sure are completed so that you stay out of trouble basically. Um, so that person would also handle uh, that. Our prior HR manager also handled the risk piece so we, there's many meetings that happen between us and our, our three um, insurance trusts, the workers' comp trust, the property trust, and the health insurance trust um, with, you know, safety inspections and those sorts of things. So that person could also take on other roles. We have, as everyone knows, we don't have an employee handbook that is up to date. We have many policies and procedures that should be written that are not currently written. We don't have up-to-date job descriptions. It's just all of those things that just kind of eat your lunch every day that none of us have the time to do. And Greg, when you talk to the diversity of the spring. workforce, go ahead, Dave. I was just going to ask Greg, when you talk to Spring and to, to Muhlenberg, they totally outsource or they have someone part-time? Um, well, Spring didn't really didn't bring it up. So I'm assuming it was the uh, township manager. Spring had... The township manager, he, he also works with finance, and they had five people that basically worked with finance. Uh, the, engine, the, the engineering department, code enforcement had four people. They did have an IT manager. They had a public works director and a foreman. And then they had, for parks and rec, they had two full-time and then two uh, part-time people. Muhlenberg had five people in the finance department, three in parks, and in, in parks and rec, the uh, system township manager, that was kind of a dual role. Uh, then they had four people in code and so forth. And then they actually had two people that were IT and then also kind of... Um, I think more communications that they did newsletters and brochures and that kind of stuff. And then they also had a HR analyst slash code enforcement person that they were 50, 50. I, I just, you know, I, I just think you, 
we should take a look at who who we have in our system and is this a growth opportunity for someone um you know promoting within can can also be a uh, positive thing and then you and then you give some staff development opportunities i i just think that needs to be looked at we may look at it and come together and then say this is what we need to do but yeah, i think convinced um i think it might be go ahead i'm done okay i was gonna say yeah I, I have no problem with someone internally but i do think Again, this was from Dave and I, and Dave, you could speak to this as well. A lot of the HR issues we had coming into the township when you and I became supervisors, it was pretty messy. Michelle Gilbert did a great job cleaning up a lot of it. And I think with the, with the diversification of the workforce, you have police officers, public work officials, corporate Three staff, minutes. office staff. There's a diversity of different people. You need at least half a body that does nothing but HR with a, just the size of the, of the department. So you're right, Greg. I, I don't care if it's someone internal or half a body does that. The other half, they do rec or something, or someone internally that we, that we could develop is a good, is a good option. But I do think that there needs to be an emphasis on HR because it was a mess before Dave and I got there, and now it's gotten. We just don't want to lose that momentum of everything getting out of control again. And thanks, John. And correct me if I'm wrong, or Jeff or, or Jen. I mean, I mean, I think the idea here is we know we need something. We don't know exactly what it is, so we're we're putting a certainly a placeholder in here for a position to be determined later. Correct. Uh, I, I, looking at the the staffing that we have here, um, I, I certainly don't feel that we are overstaffed. Um, the position, the HR position. Having done HR work when I first started in municipal government, um, you really do need, uh, especially when you have a, a police department of our size, you really need a, a good understanding of um, how, how police work, um, uh, heart and lung benefits and workers' comp and the coordination of the two, um, the pensions with the drop plans. Um, there's a lot to it just on the police side of things. Um, you know, we're negotiating the union contract here. Um, we're, you know, finalizing that. But um, as 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 uh, Jen had mentioned, there's a lot of things that um, are still hanging out there. Uh, evaluations that there was never any evaluations done um, or documents set up for department heads to evaluate their staff. Um, the the personnel manual is very outdated. Needs to be updated and and kept current. Um, in-house training that this person can provide. There's a lot of things. Um, I, I see it as a, at a minimum of a half-time person, but you're not most likely going to find somebody that, that wants to work in HR as a half-time person. Um, so uh, looking at our existing staff, I'm, I'm not really sure if we have anyone that's capable of right. stepping into that role right now um, without a lot of training. Um, but it's something we can look at. And I'm, I'm hoping that if we put this in the budget, we can do a little more study on it and determine it. But I think it, it, in the long run, I, I think it would benefit the township to have uh, another staff member, um, whether their duties are fully HR or somewhat split in a uh, assistant manager role that picks up other responsibilities or other projects um, along the way. But I, I, I could... I think evolve into a, at least a full-time position split between HR and, and other duties. And, and this is gonna sound slightly self-serving, but I'm just gonna put it out there. Um, since the HR manager has not been there, the day-to-day the -day items are not falling on my plate. We do have somebody handling those, but all of the issues and the, the helping that person and guiding that person has been falling upon my plate which has caused me to have less and less time to do my actual functions. Um, so I'm working late hours, weekends, holidays, um, and I unfortunately can't continue the way I'm going. So, you know, this is partially why the audit took longer than it should have. I had to come in on weekends to finish the audit because I don't get un uninterrupted time in, while I'm in the office. So this person needs to take those items back off of my off of my to-do list and my plate for me to be able to effectively do my role. 
Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jeff. And, and the salary you're proposing here, obviously, it could be, you might be bringing in a, a less experience, well, not maybe less practical experience, but certainly education-wise able to do it or mm -hmm. there are multiple options here. But I guess, again, the, this is a placeholder recognizing we need some kind of HR support and we will decide that later. Yeah, Jeff and I have talked, we put it in at a lower salary than the prior person was um, making, uh, doing this role with some additional duties. Um, so we did go back to a lesser salary. Um, you know, we've talked about this person does not need to have 20, 25 years experience. This person could probably have, you know, 10-ish years experience in an HR role with a bachelor's degree. Maybe it's been a, an HR generalist somewhere else. We've also talked about the fact that if this person had union experience, that would pay, you know, pay back in spades, basically, that that would be very, very beneficial. Um, I don't have any union experience and coming into a, a uh, facility that has two unions is, is a foreign, it's a foreign concept. It's, it's something that unless you have union experience, you don't know the, the ins and outs and the do's and the don'ts. So that would be something very beneficial for us. Thanks. Okay, uh, moving on. So I listed out the new requests that we've made and they're in a variety of different funds here. I tried to cover everything. So um, there is a request for, excuse me, new permitting software in the range of 20 to $40,000 in the engineering department. Um, this is the fire marshal that we previously, uh, previously uh, kind of briefly discussed where it's in as a kind of a part-time person. Um, kind of 20 hours a week, but no benefits to that position. Um, I did include the library contribution, um, the increase from 170 to $200,000 in the draft that you received. Um, so those are really in the general fund, all of the new requests that we had. Um, we can move on. So the capital funds, there are two different capital funds. Uh, fund four is uh, where we have the rental income for the DJ's office goes into that fund. So generally we've paid some kind of uh, IT and things out of there. So we put $25,000 in for server and computer replacements next year. Uh, the police, and a lot of times out of that fund, there's been some police um, items paid out of there. So. Uh, Chief had requested so the weigh-in scales, the ballistic entry shields, and the riot gear, which um, so that I put that into fund four. Uh, there's ample funds there to support those payments. Uh, fund 18 is the much larger capital fund. Uh, this is where the Perkiomen Avenue project has been running through. Um, so you'll see there, there's some grant revenue, which is the Arley grants. We're going to be receiving $299,000. Um, the green light go grant, which I actually spoke about earlier with the traffic signal replacement. So $80,000 will come back into that fund. Um, the $3.9 million is for the Perkium and Ave project with the TASA and the MTF. And then we have some recycling equipment funds, which are the recycling 902 grants that should be received in um, early 2021 for some purchases that we made in uh, late 2019 and early 2020. The expenses that are anticipated out of that fund are the Radio Shack and the Shopping Center demo that we've discussed over the past couple meetings. Uh, this is the Township Marquee sign. Um, I kind of just grabbed a number off the information that Greg had sent to us, and I think that was the, the highest kind of proposal that was on that form. So that's a, a high estimate there. And then we also have some match dollars for the MTF, the Arley Grant, and the TASA Grant. So this is the whole Perkiom and Ave project. Um, of $1.6 million. So some matching funds have come out of there. Any questions on the capital funds? Yeah. All right. Equipment fund. Uh, Larry had presented this, uh, I don't know, four, six weeks ago. So these are the items. So these are all replacing current um, items. I didn't list it on this sheet, um, but these are all replacements of prior items that, of course, we will sell and any um, sales proceeds would go back into this fund. So there's an Explorer, um, an F-150 for the admin section, uh, Public Works. They're looking to get a chipper, which is actually going to, that would be if we would receive the recycling grant that is right now in uh, the approval process. The match on that is the $9,000, um, a mini excavator, which I believe would be township slash Reading Country Club kind of shared. 
um, a cargo trailer, leaf loaders. Again, though, that's the match piece of this is a recycling grant funded item. So if we would not receive the recycling grant, we would um, kind of reevaluate whether we would purchase these things. Um, and then a Mac 10 wheeler. Uh, police, there's an F-150 and an Explorer. Again, replacements of current vehicles. Uh, and then that's kind of the equipment fund as it stands currently. Park fund, Laurie had presented this, uh, mainly what's coming out of there. There is of course the, the match for the, um, I don't have that listed here, but there is the match for the, um, the Daniel Boone master plan grant there, which is $50,000. But the main things that were coming out of the park fund this year are uh, improvements to Pineland Park and to Lorraine Hollow Park. Um, so we, we had applied for grant funding and this was kind of the matching dollars that were needed for that grant. Um, we thought we were out of the running for the grant, but Laurie actually just informed us before we got on the meeting today that we are not officially out of the running. So, but we would still need those dollars there for the match. So if we don't receive the grant, Laurie and Clarence have a kind of um, shortened list of items they would like to do with the money that we had set aside um, for the match. If we do receive the grant, then it's a, a completely different story and we'll be using these dollars, but um, getting a lot more bang for our buck basically. Um, I just listed out some other changes that I've made to the budget after the presentations were initially made. Um, so Laurie did realize after she presented her budget that she should have reduced her pavilion rental revenue by about $6,000 because we won't be future leasing the community park uh, pavilions there. Uh, so I did make that slight reduction. Um, we had approved at a prior meeting many, many months ago, I believe, the police accreditation contract for a third party vendor to handle the future police accreditation cost of that. And that was board approved. The cost of it is $30,000. So I added that back into the general fund budget that was missed when we did the police budget as well. Um, the next thing is some discussion items that I kind of need some direction on before we finalize a draft budget. So in the general fund, um, there's a projected deficit I just wanted to describe in 2020 of about $400,000 that is due, so that's for this year, that is due to reduce, reduced earned income tax that is COVID related that I've been discussing over the past couple months. That's gonna be about two to $250,000. And we've had some increased residential recycling expense that was not budgeted for um, due to the bid that we received last year and the increased um, cost to that collection bid and also the material processing. So that is what uh, will throw us kind of off of our budget numbers for 2020. Jen, Jen yes. question quick on that. Uh, I believe that from the end of September, we hadn't transferred over all the money from the sewer fan fund that you had originally planned on. Is that correct? Uh, correct. I think we have not hit the, the anticipated budget there. Okay. So that additional money you're talking about, is that on top of what has not been transferred or is that what would the shortfall be period? Uh, this is what I'm projecting the shortfall would be period based upon where we are currently. So it would actually be less than, than what you originally projected. Um, well, I projected what I, I know is going to be available in the sewer fund. I didn't project monies that aren't going to be available transferred over. Yeah. So we're going to transfer over everything we can, but we still, like I said, I don't have, there's no extra money in the sewer fund to transfer over to cover these two items. Yeah. I would rec just recommend that when we, when we do the budget that we don't put that tra fund transfer over that we would just have our revenue, our expenses. And then if it's a, I'm assuming a deficit based on the original numbers or a surplus. And then at that point in time, we know exactly where we are. I think it kind of muddies the water. Does that make sense? It does. However, you're going to be showing a severely deficit budget for, or a deficit budget for every year, which is not recommended. But, but, but if you're planning on using your fund revenue to balance your budget, which is what... But I, I'm what not... I'm not, no, what's happening is, so the money that's coming in from the sewer collections, in essence, should be posted as revenue. It, it could be posted directly as revenue in the general fund. 
we have elected to keep the sewer fund open because all of our systems in the sewer side integrate into that fund. So instead of reprogramming all of our systems, I could take every payment that comes in on a sewer account and every sewer cert that comes in and I could post it directly into the general fund. I don't because it makes my life a little bit easier because I didn't have to reprogram 15 year old systems to have them interface into the general fund. So everything posts to the sewer fund and then we then just transfer the money over. So it's not that I'm using fund balance, it's money that could and should actually be in the general fund. I think one concern with that, and I understand what, what you're saying, what you're doing, but down the road, we won't have that revenue, correct? Uh, at some point, you're right. We won't have that revenue. At some point, we will, and Jeff and I talked about this earlier today, at some point, what will most likely happen is that after we do this bond refinance, we are going to have excess funds in the debt service fund. And at that point, what's most likely going to need to happen is we can leave our tax millage in total the same, mm -hmm. but the millage, we could probably reduce the debt service tax, but transfer that millage over into the general fund. So just, and just, so again, just to clarify, so even though it shows as a transfer, all it is is just collecting the past due sewer debt which is actually going in as a re as revenue. Correct. Okay. We also haven't experienced the the um, pension cost savings yet, and also the OPEB cost savings yet, and also the the future police retirements. Um, so as the years go go forward, we're going to see less and less dollars be expending out of the general fund for pension, for police salaries, because we're going to be retiring higher costing officers and, and you know, hiring lower costing um, officers. So there are future cost savings that are going to come as the, the plan kind of unfolds. You know, we have a 15 year police contract with many, many future cost savings that need a couple years under their belt to fully implement themselves. Um, so as an, what is it? I think it's at least half, if not 70% of our police force will be retired over the next 15 years. Um, they're all kind of spinning off two at a time over the next couple of years. So every two that go, we hire at a lower rate. Same thing as the pension, as the pension valuation gets um, put into place with the deposits that we put in last year, we won't be expending general fund dollars. We'll just be taking that state aid in and then pushing that state aid back out into the plan. There won't be extra. We're right now, we're putting an extra $300,000 of pension out into the pension plans. No, thanks, Jen. And it's a good point. It brings me back to a document about four or five months ago. I'm in the sewer proceeds and the future savings. And I think you know, in coming years, that was you know, very significant uh, increases with the pension funds and everything else you're mentioning, Jen. So referring back to that document, I think it was back in May or something, we published that of what the future savings were going to be with those. Yes. Things. And the police contract that we did was yeah. on track to save about $7 million in, in, those, in, in those 15 years as right. officers retire and we bring in new officers at a lesser rate mm -hmm. and lesser pension and benefits. Yeah, and, and, and look, all those, all those things, everything we're talking about there is positive. I'm just, and again, I'm trying to do this from memory. Did we use the, the sewer payments, not the reserve, not the, not the fund balance? was anticipated about 1.3 last year. Jen, does that sound about right? 1.7. Um, uh, something like, yeah, a million, something like that, yes. I thought it was 1.3, and we're anticipating how much this year? Um, 1.6? Uh, let me see. Oh. Yeah, so we've okay. brought in about $750,000 so far this year. Okay. Okay. So it's, 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 it sounds like it's going to be pretty close to covering it without using any fund balance, which is great. Right. So, so just, part of that 1.7 next year, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Joe, but is 
collection of past due balances. Um, and I did forward kind of forward load those a little bit only because next year we're going to be, we're working with Liz's office right now to, as we've talked about, to aggressively collect those balances. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping for aggressive collection next year of a, a, a good chunk of that balance. Um, and also we have a bunch of outstanding dollars when it comes to um, insurance claims. I did not calculate all of those into this budget. I did not say that we were gonna get all of our eggs in this basket. So, but I did say we're going to get a portion of those insurance proceeds. So that's why it's so high next year. And then it kind of filters off after that. And the, Jen, the insurance proceeds go into the, would go into the general fund, correct? Uh, some of them would. So we have this deceptive business interruption claim, which is about $700,000. So that was sewer related. That would come into the general fund. The, um, the pump failure fix is, uh, it's about a million dollars. Uh, that would also come in because that was sewer related. So that would come into the general fund as well. The traveler's bond claim that Jeff and I were talking about today, that has to do with bond proceeds. So I am not calling that any kind of usable dollars. I believe that may have to go through bond council as to what would happen with those funds when they come back. Um, we have an, an insurance claim about the water intrusion at the country <laughs> club. That money came out of the clubhouse fund. So that money should go back into the clubhouse fund. Um, so there's a variety of different uh, large ticket items that should be coming to fruition over the next, hopefully, year. But again, I did not slide them all in next year because I know that we don't want to count on all of that money at one point. Thanks. Um, going back... Uh, there could be some cost savings. I'm still working on finalizing the roll-up, basically, of health, property, workers' comp, and pension in the budget for 2021 and for 2022 and 23. So I most likely have a high estimate in here at this point. That takes a little more uh, refinement because we, we push everything down to the program level. So I have to kind of roll everything together and make sure that I'm not overestimating what they've told us will be our final dollar amounts. I do have an increase in here, so we are covered, but I'm hoping there's gonna be some savings there as well over the next week. Um, next item, I need a little bit of help and guidance. Um, there was some golf operations requests um, for capital and equipment items. Um, I wasn't sure which of these, I don't believe any of them are worked into the golf operations budget, nor are they worked into the equipment or the capital fund. So I needed to know which of these we would like to move forward with or to put in the budget. Um, there was some mention of bunker renovations, the master plan, some T markers and signs, drainage improvements, cart path improvements, tree removals driving range improvements, and then there's four items listed under equipment. So I wasn't sure um, how much of this we were going to put into the budget. Yeah, we're going to have to be cautious here. Yeah, I got to... You can't just throw, keep throwing money at it. Right. I mean, we're doing very well, um, but I have my take on this, so I'll let others comment. But my take after having some discussions on this, everything up top there above equipment, so bunker renovations, master plan, whatever, all that stuff, you need a plan of what's going to give you the most bang for your buck. And it depends, well, first before that, the way we've been proceeding, I think, with the golf courses, as times are good, we're able to do things. We're not, you know, spending money we don't, don't have or we're not going to think we're going to have in the future. So we're doing a very good job there and business is good and everything else. But I agree with John, you got to be cautious. Back to my thing, you got two funds here, capital fund, and, well, and then you got general expenses and you got the equipment fund. So my take is everything above the equipment area there flows out of a plan, which is a master plan we've been talking about for years. We do this. Time, yep. We do it with everything else, you know, and this is a capital budget item. And I know out of that master plan, if we choose to do that, which I think is the first step, will come some recommendations to fix some very necessary things that are going to give you the most return for your dollars. So I would, I would suggest on that whole top part is, you know, 
general agreement on, you know, we can vote on it later or whatever, a master plan, but putting something aside like $50,000 earmarked or just putting in the capital fund, not saying we're going to spend it, but the same process we begin going through, you've come to a decision and is it going to be a good return? The second point I would make is on the equipment fund, you know, everything we did last year really paid off, gave good returns and everything else. I think we'd be cautious as well. You know, you put this, you know, something earmarked in there that doesn't mean you're going to spend it, but, you know, a dollar amount in the equipment fund. And as if one of these things break or it's not repairable, whatever, we make that decision at that time. Based on that and how the finances are going and how business is doing. So I can consider both of these placeholders, but I mean, I know the discussion, if you put nothing in there, well, you're not going to have the discussion and say it's not available. Um, so th what I've added up here is my suggestion off the top, I'll leave it open to everyone else is, you know, just putting $70,000 in the equipment fund and 50,000 in the capital fund, not saying we're spending any of that, but master plan has to be done before anything's spent there. Yes, that uh, plan needs to be done before we start spending money on um, the money pit. So we have to be careful. <clears throat> so that was my, I agree with the, the master, master plan, but I would take a look at it. And Clarence talked about uh, equipment and equipment sharing. You, you look at something like the library. We're already given 170000 There's multiple funds that have been given there. Do we bump that up to 200000 I mean, that's, that's a big ask. I agree, Jeff. Yeah. So, I mean, you look, I mean, every one of these has to be voted on anyhow. My recommendation is we would put, we would put it in the preliminary budget for us to review, see exactly what the deficit would be at that point in time, and then you start to make your decisions on yes or no. But again, too, you certainly have the opportunity. I mean, for, for, the, for the reading right now, the first thing I would do is, again, it would be the master plan. And the, the slabs and the mats have to, they're going to have to be done eventually. But everything else from an equipment standpoint, uh, Brian certainly can make it work. You do, you do, do your market if you can. I think it's no different than an HR specialist. You make your determination whether or not you can get someone at the right number. I think also it's going to depend on how revenues flow at the beginning of the year with COVID. We still don't know what's going on. I mean, you know, based on what the stock market did today, the world, the world's perfect um, because they feel that we're going to have a vaccine. So there's, there's so many unknown, unknown uh, entities here that we just, I think a lot of this, we're just going to have to make a determination um, when it does come up, whether or not to, to make that decision. When you put this into a budget, that does not mean that you're going to spend it on any type of expenditure like that. So. Yeah. But I, I would definitely, the, the first thing I would do would be the master plan. And we have to respect the taxpayers and keep taxes flat as well. Well, the, our, our taxes have been reduced. I mean, eventually, again, we're getting, we're getting our expenses under control, and I, especially during COVID because there have been a lot of people hurt. Yes. I'm certainly not advocating raising taxes. Just, yes. just you know, I'm I, just saying, I do not. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of a, people that have been adversely affected. That's a non-starter for the sport. Can I finish, John? Yeah, uh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> just, my internet's in and out, so uh, it's, my, well, it's, it's my, my ears. My ears, <laughs> my ears are working all the time. Um, uh, so as far as far as that, I, I you know, we certainly want to take a look at it, and I'd also like to have a better understanding of what Jen feels we're going to collect. Again, not from fund, but from the sewer payment that's coming in. So if you, if you have these capital projects or these certain things that can be funded with money that is that was basically written off at one point in time, then that's the time to do it. Right. So so we've prepared the budget with no um, with no tax increase. Um, so we've made it work for 2021 with no tax increase, and they are um, uh, legitimate, believable numbers that of fun funds that will come in. I kept the earned income tax at basically the same level as this year uh, of our experience rate for this year. Same thing with real estate taxes. So I kept them kind of in a a 
COVID, uh, COVID is still here world. I didn't say that 2021 was going to go back to, we never heard of COVID-19 before. <laughs> so I was, um, you know, taking that into account of this, this is going to be a slow return, um, a slower return to normal when it comes to the revenues. So we have taken, I believe, everything you just kind of stated, Joe, into account with this, sure. with this budget. So um, I'm comfortable with the, the, the general fund revenue numbers that they will come in. Um, and, and we always, like, I think I explained this in the engineering department, we always kind of underestimate or put a more comfortable level of engineering things in there. Um, but it generally seems like, and hopefully I'm not jinxing us now, that there's one-time things that kind of occur every year, um, which kind of help us um, in that department as well. So we could see higher than, than anticipated revenues in the engineering department, also in the police department. I know Chief kept the, the fees and things um, pretty stable, but we could also see increases in there that we, that we didn't plan for. So hopefully there's, there's good things to come that we haven't actually baked into this budget. And what's the timeline again um, from this point forward, Jen? Please. I'm sorry, say that one time, one more time. The, the, I'm sorry, the, the timeline again for the, the budget. The budget approval process? Yes. So you have to advertise for 20 days before you can uh, adopt a final budget. So if we would on the 23rd, which is the 23rd of November, which is the next regularly scheduled meeting, put it into draft. Um, we could approve it on December 14th. That, that would give us, I believe, 21 days between November 23rd and December 14th. And in the, between that period of time, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, you can make slight changes. Yeah, um, you, yeah you can. In the second class township code, you can make uh, slight changes from your preliminary to the final approved budget. Um, it's no more than a 10% um, in entirety or right. 25% in, in a particular line. Mm -hmm. So um, that does give you some leeway. So if we, you know, last minute found some savings or an unknown expense that came in, um, you would have the opportunity to make that final adjustment. Um, even after it was advertised, you can make that final adjustment and then vote on it on uh, December 14th. The preliminary would be what meeting? The 23rd, 23rd. November okay. 23rd. And that would give and us then, ample time for advertisement to adopt. Okay. And, and if we need to adjust things, like scale things back and spending, that gives us time. Okay. All right. So did I hear, uh, 50, for the, uh, back to the country club golf operations, $50,000 of expenses to put, be put into the capital fund and $70,000 of expense to be put into the equipment fund. That was that was my suggestion, Jim. Is, just to yeah. clarify, you know, just putting that in there doesn't really affect the budget. These are funds that have money in them. We we're not okay. we're going to spend that, but it's just to put a placeholder there. Agreed, agreed. And and as somebody had stated before, just because we put something in the budget doesn't mean that it's automatically spent. spent. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean that that person is automatically hired. It doesn't mean that that money is automatically spent. So this is just our best guess. And then as the year start, you know, pans out, we will of course bring these things back for approval. And you know, and if if the money is not there, we of course are not going to bring it to you for approval. Yeah. Um, okay. I do have a I do have a question, Jen, with with the yep. golf. So I, when looking at the golf report, I think it's plus 139,000 at the end of October. Did I see that right? That sounds right, yes. Okay, so obviously it, it probably won't finish at 139,000 because Correct. we're hitting a period of time where your expenses are probably gonna be higher than your income. Right, it, or, or slow down, yes, correct. So then, so what happens then with that surplus at the end of the year? How does that? That, that stays in the fund balance. So that stays in the checking account, basically. It's, it's no different than your own personal finances. If you don't spend all of your paycheck in a year, it stays in your checking account for the next year. So that's what's called fund balance. That's your reserves. So that would give them some reserves in the future in case we would have a year where expenses exceed revenue. God forbid, we're not, I'm hoping that doesn't happen, but it would give them a cushion, a savings account. 
Um, I know we had talked as well. I didn't um, for the, you know, we're paying for the equipment out of the equipment fund. We're doing like a five-year repayment plan. I started that repayment plan next year, but I know we had discussed if there was money there at the end of the year, we could potentially make that transfer with board approval, you know, one of those transfers at the end of this year and kind of start that early if they had some extra cash laying around. So okay, I didn't want to, I didn't want to put that into place until we know that. It's all separate. It doesn't go into the general fund. All Absolutely not. No, no. Okay. no. We operate under fund accounting. So when I present the treasurer's report, each of those funds, I always reference it. It's a separate checking account, basically. So everything stays in its own silo unless we authorize a transfer between the two. Okay, great. Okay. Thank yeah, Joe mentioned that if we have the money, we could pay off the mowers that we bought sooner than the five years. As, an, as, a, as a potential opportunity. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that would be something, because it's unbudgeted and unplanned for, that we would bring to the board to get approval at that point if we thought that was a good recommendation. Okay? Very good. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next thing I'm going to address um, is, actually, let's skip down to the, the next bullet point. This was kind of stream of consciousness, unfortunately. <laughs> so um, now that I'm looking back at it, it doesn't fully make sense. Um, the wastewater proceeds fund. So, of course, this is where the right now there's $54 million sitting in there from the wastewater proceeds. Um, the only real anticipated revenue other than interest uh, that we are looking for that fund is we have a, an escrow account um, associated with the sale of the plant. So when we sold the plant, the dryer was not functioning. The, the sludge dryer was not functioning and they didn't want to hold up the sale of the plant. So the $770,000, which was uh, an estimate made uh, by the township and PA American that we agreed upon of how much it would cost to fix the dryer at that point. PA American signed an escrow agreement and that money, $770,000, went into an escrow that's handled by U.S. Bank. Um, PA American handled the repairs of the dryer and then after the repairs are complete, they will take a drawdown from this escrow. So there have been no draws made to date because the dryer is not fully, fully functioning. Um, according to PA American, there's a small punch list left and then COVID kind of threw them into a whirlwind where the contractor couldn't come back on site. So they've been trying to kind of finalize the repairs. They will be making a draw down from this escrow account, which I've been told it costs approximately four to $500,000. I think it's around $450,000 to repair it. So that escrow money would come back to the township because it's part of the sales agreement. So if we would receive that escrow back next year, which I hope we would, because we're already a year into this process, the $300,000 should be put back into the wastewater proceeds account because that's where it came from. It came from the $93.5 million. So that would be the revenue going in there. The future expenses we have for this um, fund are the OPEB trust, which we've talked about, which is the $10 million we are choosing to put aside to fund future uh, post-employment benefit payments. So this is the $10 million that we put aside that is going to pay for about $30 million of benefit costs for future retirees. So this is a savings plan to pay for the next 20 to 30 years of benefit costs. Um, there are some stormwater basin repairs that is a, I think Clarence, is this like a 20 year project? Mm, no, no, it's, it's not that long. I not mean, not you, that can, long? you can stretch it a little farther than one. <laughs> no, it's, it's not, not 20 years. Okay. So this is a project. We have many stormwater basins that need repaired. I there's eight of them all together. Okay. There, um, Joe Rogoski has been working on this for a couple of years. Um, so this is there, of course, they cost a lot of money to repair. Um, and we really should probably put some money aside to pay for these repairs. So we are doing, I think it's, it's the eight of them. And it's one of these things where you do the, the engineering work in one year, and then you do the construction work the next year. So if we would allocate $4 million towards this, we could repair all of these stormwater basins and be done with this project. Um, there is one final debt service payment that is going to be made for that uh, series 2007 bond that was not callable at the time of the sale. So we made one $2.2 million payment this year in 2020, 2020, and then the last one is next year. And we had allocated that to come out of this fund. Um, this is the clubhouse capital injection, which I'll go back and talk about. 
2.8 million dollars and then we've been transferring interest out of this fund as we need it uh, for the general fund and this is a uh, part of the general fund so the transfer of interest would come out of here as well into the general fund so going back to the clubhouse capital injection that's the bullet point above this one so we had talked about, and it's of course listed in the audit as a recommendation, the negative fund balance that currently exists in the RCC clubhouse fund due to um, legal fees, utilities, and building repairs that have come up in the past three-ish years. So currently there's a negative fund balance of $2.4 million, million, which the general fund has lent this fund the money. They have temporarily um, you know, funded this so there is a, um, you know, a negative fund balance that really should be repaid to the general fund. Uh, so it's $2.4 million currently. Um, I'm approximating for the remainder of 2020, there'd be another $250,000 of expenses in this fund. That would be to do the HVAC work, which we authorized, um, a couple more months of utilities for the clubhouse. Um, there's some attic lighting, which there's a recommendation to put some lighting in the attic, which would help with the HVAC replacement. And also we have to do some carpet repairs, which is underway. We've paid the deposit already, but there's a final balance of about $2,000 that needs to be repaid. Uh, we would also provide capital to this fund for the 2021 expenses in the anticipation that there won't be um, a food and beverage vendor in there for a bit into 2021. I'm not saying the full year, but I wanted to provide enough money in there that if need be, the fund could sustain itself for the entire year. Um, so that's about $147,000. Uh, I put in there $10,000 for legal fees if we would be negotiating a, a new possible lease, uh, $50,000 for utilities to keep the place up and running, um, more building repairs. We, of course, have to pay the balance of the HVAC, and I put um, another like $25,000 of miscellaneous repairs if something would come up into the budget, and it costs us about $3,000 for um, the insurance on that building a year. So that amounts to $2.8 million, which we had talked previously about transferring that from the wastewater proceeds fund into the clubhouse fund so that it the clubhouse fund could then a pay off the loan that the general fund has lent it over the past couple of years and also have some capital pro to provide for future bills all right that is the end of my budget synopsis <laughs> um i'm hoping i made things a little clearer of where we stand um, no, you did. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. I do have one more question. Absolutely. Um, so when you look at the overall budget and your, your revenue versus your expenses, at, at one point, and I'm not sure if it was a meeting or if I just had discussion with a person, maybe it was when we were interviewing township managers or something. But we, we recognize that our revenue is going to be less because of COVID and that we might have to use reserves for a year or two to balance the budget. Is that something you're anticipating or won't we have to do that because of the sewer plant uh, collection items? I'm anticipating for 2020, we're going to have to use about $400,000 of reserves that are in the general fund uh, to cover the 2020 um, shortfall. Right. But 2021, I don't, I, we're projecting that there will be no shortfall. I've already reduced the, I've reduced the revenue in the 2021 budget to mirror the uh, decrease in revenues we've experienced due to COVID in 2020. Okay, you know so you're going to balance a, balance a budget without having to use reserves. I did, yes. And I already uh, layered COVID over top of the budget, I'm going to say. So I already took where we fell short in the revenues this year, I replicated that shortfall in 2021. I didn't say we're going back to full 100% revenue. I said we're going to remain at a decreased revenue amount and we were still able to balance the budget and have um, have not a deficit for 2021 anticipated. Oh, I, I got what you're saying. And okay. then offhand, do you know how much we're saving in legal fees in the budget? Um, hold on, I can tell you. 
Quite a bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, just our, our, monthly, our monthly invoices are are drastically lower than they had been. I know when. Um, yeah. Okay, so here it is. So in 2019, so this, so we have three different legal categories. There's just general counsel, and then we have labor counsel, and then we have special counsel. Special counsel is when we pull in extra people, conflict counsel, uh, bond counsel, those kinds of things. Okay. So our general legal counsel in 2019, we spent $364,000. We budgeted in 2020 to spend $375,000. I'm approximating we're going to spend about $270,000 this year based upon what's already been spent and the next three-ish months uh, for October, uh, November, I'm sorry, two-ish months. Based upon what our legal bills have been running for the past month or two after we made the switch, um, I'm approximating it should be about $120,000 for next year. Okay. So we've been paying about $10,000 a month in legal fees for the prior couple months uh, during the transition, after we made the transition. Yeah, keep in mind, though, a lot of the big issues are over the JMH, the sewer plant. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's, same that's, thing that's, with, that's the reason. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Same thing with labor. So 2019, it was $135,000. Um, we budgeted $100,000 for this year. I'm approximating we're going to spend about $62,000 um, next year based upon what our labor bills have been running and uh, crossing our fingers, hopefully, that we will have a union contract with the Teamsters in a short amount of time. I'm saying it's going to be about $24,000 based upon our current run rate. So let's stay out of lawsuits. Please. Yes. All right. Thank you. Yep. A question for Jen or Jeff. I mean, we haven't heard much. I mean, but at the the COVID uh, federal trickle down to state, trickle down to local government. Do we anticipate any potential support? Um, I if we would. It's nothing like of major significance. Um, it would pay for some some cleaning services. Some. Um, um, PPE for the uh, police department, things of that nature. But in terms of major money, um, I don't envision it trickling down uh, to municipalities, unless Jen, unless you've heard something different. I've not. Um, so uh, Sergeant Bentz, who's our emergency management coordinator, has been handling the actual COVID grants process. Um, I filter information to him, but he works with the county on the actual process. Um, the, the, for the expenses, I've been tracking the hard expenses. Um, I think we're somewhere between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars of, uh, like Jeff said, PPE. We had some additional, um, uh, an additional day of cleaning each week that we've been paying for in the building to try and keep, um, you know, the building as clean as possible. So we probably, I'm hoping, we'll see that money back because that was actual hard dollar outlay. Um, I know the county did receive funding that they think may trans, uh, trickle down to us. I know they didn't receive as much funding as they were hoping or as some of our neighboring counties had received. Um, so I can, I wrote a note here to check in with Sergeant Bentz to see what the status of all of that is. I know he also uh, submitted for some kind of soft dollar costs, um, you know, some part of his salary, um, I think part of Larry Pearsall's salary because he's um, part of the safety committee and helping with the PPE and things. So I'm not sure how much of that money we will or won't see. Okay, thanks. All righty, you have everything you need for now? Um, I think so. I think my real only question was some direction on the golf operations requests and those equipment requests. So I will move forward as we had discussed. Um, but unless anything uh, has, and if anybody has anything else, uh, Jeff and I will prepare the draft budget um, pretty much as you've seen it, as we, we presented it to you here with those small slight changes. And I will keep track of any other um, increases, decreases. Hopefully there are only decreases in expenses that we may kind of work out over the next week. Yeah, and, you'll, and you'll have the end of October numbers by the next meeting as well, right, Jen? Yes, yes. They will okay, so we'll have a better understanding of where we are through 2020. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.
And thanks, Jeff, uh, Greg, also for requesting. I think it was good to get another review in there before the, the final. All right, department reports. Uh, Joe? Uh, just one quick item, um, just an update. We heard from the developer of Pathfinder Meadows. They are interested in um, constructing their second phase. This has been previously approved by the township. It's just been sitting idle for a while. Um, the developer has reached out to our office and, and the township, and we'll be coordinating with them, uh, preparing an improvements agreement. Uh, reviewing reviewing the plans uh, as far as the improvements that are required along Shoffers Road and also be uh, coordinating with Liz's office as well. Just want to let the board know that this project may be forthcoming in the next couple of months or so. That's all I have for tonight. Thanks, John. Thank uh, Keith? Uh, not much. Uh, just that we uh, had a safe Halloween uh, this year. Put extra patrols out in the uh, township for Halloween. Um, our officers were also able to give out um, um, some candy. Uh, it was well received, uh, received a lot of positive uh, feedback with our officers out there. Also, we had a, a safe election day. Um, there were no issues. Uh, we didn't have to respond uh, to any of the polling locations. That was also uh, positive. Um, everyone was patient and uh, uh, well behaved in the, in the long lines that was observed through, uh, throughout the township. That's it. Very good. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Clarence? Yeah. Um, leaves. <laughs> pretty much for the highway department is leaves. Leaves and more leaves. We have five pickers going uh, most days. Um, some days just four, but uh, um, so far we've been able to keep up pretty well. With 20 all. days or 21 days you have to have it in the paper for the budget. Oh, Liz, you're on. <laughs> What's that? No, but she was, on, she was talking about it. She's on mute now. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, anyway, the, uh, that's going real well. Um, and uh, like I told you, we, we met up, Larry and myself met up with UGI today. So, we, we were up there trying to get that place buttoned up. Um, um, the only other thing is today, Brian called me this morning and uh, we went over there at the country club. And unfortunately, it's just, you know, it's just news I got to give you that by next meeting, I'll, I'll have some kind of a number for you. Uh, there's a piece of molding that's off at the very highest point of the peak of the building on the west end. Um, there's also some pieces of slate loose on right in that area. And uh, Brian found a hole in the back wall in one of the rooms that never gets used uh, up on the third floor. Um, so it's got some roof rot there. So we're gonna get some quotes, get some numbers, and we'll have that for you by the next, next meeting. Very good. Thanks, Clarence. Uh, Jeff? Um, just the one item I mentioned earlier um, regarding the uh, promenade site um, and our feasibility study. KCBA has completed their um, feasibility study um, of our existing facilities. And during that process, they also developed our programming needs moving forward for all the departments um, based on what we currently have and what we'd like to see um, moving into a potentially a new facility. Um, they put this whole thing together um, and they will be making a presentation um, at the next meeting on the 23rd. Um, th at that point, um, depending on the board's uh, take on it, then you can um, possibly, uh, depending on their final recommendations, we might possibly be looking to uh, contract them with KCBA to move ahead with design of a new facility. Um, that could either be at the current location here um, or at the promenade site. Um, we'll know the final details from their presentation. Um, I can, can tell you though, uh, from what they have told myself and the staff, um, that they are leaning towards um, moving to 
a new location that we simply do not have enough space at this current location and the cost of re tearing things down and rebuilding at this location um, would be astronomical. Um, we would have to go up um, and put buildings on top of buildings and we would most likely not be able to fit everything in here that we were hoping to fit in, including a, a potential new fire station and a community center building. So um, we're gonna hear from them. They'll have their full presentation um, and uh, we'll see, uh, see how that plays out. Um, the staff did a great job working with KCBA. Um, there were some follow-up phone calls from them. They, they met here on site with us, spent several days uh, walking around uh, surveying everything, the mechanical systems, and um, everything about what we have here. They were up at the promenade site. Uh, they were down at Trout Run looking at what we store down there uh, to try and get a, a really good big picture of all future township needs. And um, they, they took a lot of pictures, uh, did a, a lot of evaluation um, for the uh, facility. And um, several times the uh, the, the architects complimented our staff uh, to me, stating how, how well-versed our staff was in, in their concept of what they want to see and uh, we're able to provide a lot, a lot of good information. So um, we're looking forward to seeing what they, they have on the 23rd. Hey, Jeff, I have a question. One of the things we talked about with KCBA and they said that they would do it and it's going to be, I know, difficult with COVID was to get the public involved with two or three meetings whether that's virtual, whether that's socially distanced at the Dunn yeah. Center or somewhere. Well, do, you, do you have a roadmap for that yet? We, we've discussed that, that whole concept with them. And basically, at, at this point, from a feasibility standpoint, um, we provided them with as much information from the public as we could. The information uh, from the surveys regarding a community center, um, the information from the fire company based on what they would like to see for a new fire station, and then internally, our staff here. The public, in, in all honesty, probably doesn't know a whole lot about the inner workings of our building in terms of space utilization and, and how big offices are or aren't big enough. Um, you know, I don't know if the public really knows everything about our police department, how they're somewhat fragmented in their, where they're staffing people now. Um, I think some people might have gotten an indication driving through our public works garage during the Halloween event to see how packed in that building is. And we only had half of our vehicles in there uh, for that event. Um, so they, they felt that the importance of involving the public would be moving to the next phase, which is the actual design of the, and that's where they would uh, definitely hold they're not sure how they would do it. S several um, public meetings, whether they were uh, scheduled in, a, in a, an area, a uh, small number of people, and you had to make a reservation and then bring another group in and another group in to get the input from the residents on what they would like to see going forward. The, the feasibility study basically just looked at what we have here right now and, and uh, all our facilities. And they felt that it made sense um, to, to take the information that they got, put it together, and then say, this is our recommend recommendation moving forward. And um, at that point, they felt that it would be imp and more important to bring the public in, uh, especially concerning things like a fire station, um, a community center. Um, one, one of the, the, the issues that came up, and our entire staff agreed and brought it up, was the fact that um, our public meeting room is, is woefully too small for the size population that we have in the township. Even without COVID, um, that room was too small and wasn't adequate for a large public meeting. And that was something that all of us uh, um, explained to them. So they're, they're looking at probably tripling the size of, of what we have right now going forward. Um, so that, you know, those kinds of things we already heard from the public and we made sure we forwarded that on to the, uh, to the architects. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Um, uh, Liz. I have nothing to report unless you have any questions for me. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Uh, public comment, non-agenda items. 
Uh, we had one, oh, but you know what? Do we want to do the executive sessions now? That announcement. Well, I can. I was going to do that under supervisor reports. Can do it. Okay. Yeah. All right. I just don't want to miss it. Yeah, we can do it right now. We held uh, two executive sessions: one on October twenty first, twenty twenty, and one on November fifth, twenty twenty, both dealing with personnel matters. Would you that classify it, Liz? It classifies it. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for the reminder, Laura. Okay, and we had one public comment submitted, and it's from uh, Brandon uh, Brandon Cock. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Brandon W. Koch, and I am inquiring as to actions completed on towers residing at the police administration complex and its potential risk on the immediate community. Since my tenure as a township intern in the early 2010s, there have been multiple additions and equipment modifications relating to the towers located at the Damas Road complex. After reviewing meeting notes online from 2015 current, I am unable to verify that structural analysis studies have been completed congruent with the movement or additions of antenna S and associated coaxial cabling within the confines of the tower footprint. Going further, I was unable to ascertain via budget scrutiny that funds have been expended to complete an integrity study within the same time frame. Lastly, an attempt was made on the FCC antenna registration portal, which also came up empty. Given the proximity to public meeting areas, first responder equipment, government buildings and the main township thoroughfare has recent analysis occurred relative to the integrity and capabilities of the towers. While purely a novice observation, weather events are getting stronger and there are visibly more antennas of larger size on the tower. The last thing I would want to see is an avoidable catastrophe in the township. Thank you for your time and attention to this potentially critical issue. So Jeff, Jeff or Clarence, I guess can address this. I think the tower's gone. Well, tower's gone, yeah. yeah. Good, Clarence, you wanna? Yeah, the tower is gone. They they took that away a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm not really sure what he's saying about that they put larger pieces on. They did change some a couple of years ago uh, to upgrade them, but they weren't any larger. Uh, but they're, it's gone now anyway, so it's a mute point. As far as that tower is gone, it, it's, it's totally out of here. Yeah. The, the other tower that still exists here um, is basically not functioning at the top of it. Um, the only functioning antenna on it, I believe, is the one that's halfway up. I think that's our county uh, connection uh, for, for the police. Um, the top half of it uh, is, is somewhat obsolete. Um, we do know that if we leave this site, that most likely we're going to have to remove that entire tower all the way down. Um, the, our insurance carrier, when they did their site inspection, their only recommendation was they felt that we should spruce it up, um, put a coating of paint on it, which is gonna cost at least 10 or $12,000 to paint a pole that we're most likely gonna be taking down. Um, so I, I'm not really sure, you know, that no new antenna have been added on that pole in, from what Clarence said, at least 15 years or so. It's been gutted, and also the well, they, they did do an integrity uh, uh, examination of that one years ago, and found the engineers found that it could not be used anymore as a phone tower. Uh, I, I think at some point we should really consider, at the very least, taking half of that, take the top eighty feet off, just to, just to get it down because it's. At some point, you're going to have to take it down anyway. So, yeah. just but, to take the yeah. risk away. It, well, based on these this resident's comments, I'm not really sure exactly what it means because the other tower was removed, right? Um, and that was only supposed to be a temporary that was, um, yeah. thing. It was, was supposed to be there for six or nine months, and it was there for ten years. Yeah. Um, so, but that just came down within the past two weeks. 
And I guess one other thing to reference, maybe Jeff, we know, is the new ordinance we passed, I mean, whatever it was, a couple months ago, around for future towers and safety and everything else, functionality of, of the future towers, you know, being more specific as to the shape they're in. Any other comments from anyone? Yeah, I, I just I just want to clarify. So the tower you guys were talking about, we all, it isn't needed? Is no. that correct? Well, the, the white tower that that gentleman was talking about, that's gone. No, I'm talking about the and other. Now this gray one here by the garage is still here, and all it's on, it, I believe, is just the radio for the county, right? Yeah, the county radio and our truck radio. Yeah, the county radio and our truck radios. That's, that's all it's being used for. Uh, so we are using it. Yeah, but I, yeah, I'm, yeah, it's only the halfway up though, so I'm not sure that we really need to have the whole. I just think for for safety's sake, it would be a good idea to get at least eighty. It's 165 feet, so I, I, it would so be a good idea to get rid of at least 80 feet of it. Is that something you would do? Or would you have to bid that out, Clarence? Oh yeah, <laughs> we'd have to get a crane company in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, we'd have to look into that. I, well, I, I think it, if it's unsafe, we should get estimates on it and well, get it done. The uh, an engineering company for one of the phone companies did a uh, an ex uh, an examination of it years ago, and that's why they wouldn't put any more phones on it because. They said it's not safe. And once an engineer says it's, you know, well, they put their stamp on it, it's done. It's well, then, I, I, I really think we should do something about this then. Yeah, I, sooner or later you're going to have to anyway. So, mm -hmm. so Before someone gets hurt or there is... Yeah, problem. Chuck's eyes fall off of that thing, you know, during the winter. It's it's, it's dead. Yeah, I, agree. I, I agree with Greg. We should do it sooner rather than later. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to get some estimates. Yeah. Yep. We can get that get that thing down. So, it I, I mean, we're, we're talking about the last thing we want to have is someone get hurt. Yeah. Especially so, with, the ambulance, with the ambulance right there, Greg, you know, that God forbid if an ambulance is coming in and a chunk of ice falls, you know, through an ambulance, you know, right. it can be catastrophic. Yeah. Good. We'll get some numbers for you. Thank you. Very good. Thanks. All right, that's it for public comment, Laura. That's it. All right, supervisor reports. Uh, John? Just, I did forget one question for Jen on the budget. Um, Jen, the recycling impact, do we have that yet? How much it's going to cost us and what potential increase we may have to give to the residents? Or is that still uh, factored to be factored based off the bids we get back? Yeah. We uh, yeah. Yeah. I did not address that. So we included the ex the current expense of the current bid. So we are we are going to rebid it for next year and hopefully receive um, some options for the board to evaluate um, of of different options for to hopefully decrease expenses. Um, I did include a slight increase to the recycling fee in the revenue section that we will have to um, talk about in the future. Okay, thank you. And then I just want to credit Lori for uh, DocuSign. And I know it saved Joe and I a lot of time from having to run around. <laughs> so congratulations, Lori, if that was you or Jeff or whoever, but that was a great tool that really uh, makes things a lot easier for us to go sign things. Great. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Excellent, thanks. Uh, Michelle? I have nothing this evening. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Joe? Uh, a couple things, again, uh, well done on the right to know request, uh, five days uh, or less uh, returning those. That's great. Appreciate the, the audit findings, which were, again, very, very solid. And then one thing, if um, folks haven't heard, um, Dr. David Bender passed away. I had the pleasure of ser serving with Dr. Bender on the school board. I believe it was 34 years. Um, he passed away the other day. So thoughts and prayers to um, his family. He was a tremendous asset to the community. Thanks, Joe. Greg? 
Yeah, I, I want to thank Tina Stevens with the Right to Know requests. She's do, been doing a great job with that. That was really good to see. And Jen, I want to thank you for uh, all the additional information. Great. Thanks, Greg. Is that it? Yep. Yeah, and I echo the I echo a lot of those those comments, Jen. Certainly, thanks for answering all our questions and getting us through this. And uh, congrats on the 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 audit and everything. But that that's all I have. So hope everyone stays safe. So with that, we'll take a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Michelle, very good. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thanks, everyone. Have a good, good night, night everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good evening. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.